Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's overview and scrutiny meeting. I would like to start with um, apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Elizabeth Ige and Linda Bird, and I'm not aware of any others. Um, item two, urgent business. So uh, as an action from our meeting on the 11th of May 2023, we did request that a briefing note updating members on the uh, highways term uh, contract procurement would be circulated. That happened yesterday. Uh, the tender timetable shows the procurement is due for competition in late December, followed by a three-month mobilization period beginning in January 2024. So what I would just like to put out to members here is where we would like to see this monitoring coming up. I see that we sort of have several options that we could take it back to over scrutiny in either November or February, or the one I would sort of be inclined to move towards is that we might delegate further scrutiny of this item to the Corporate Finance and Performance Scrutiny Panel. I don't know if you'd like to, if you've got views on that, Council Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm um, happy to do that. It's a contract uh, that needs review. So happy to take that delegation if the rest of the panel agree. And I think um, I will then work with the Corporate Finance and Performance Scrutiny Panel to slotted in and where we will add best value in the process i think in scrutiny fantastic so you you have the um the the tender timetable you, you're aware of that so yep. great members happy to agree that we'll leave that with corporate finance performance okay i am seeing assent thank you very much item three declarations of interest uh, councillor williams uh, thank you again chair uh, there's mention of uh, dg cities in one of the reports i am on the board of dg cities thank you very much uh, item four, update on, re oh, sorry, Councillor Hartley. Sorry, I, um, I work for a debt advice charity and we're talking about debt advice under cost of living crisis. Thank you very much. Any others? Nope, okay. Item four, update on rethinking services. So I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Damon Cook, Director of Finance. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, largely take the report as read, but I'll just uh, sort of recap uh, some of the sort of salient points uh, within it. So basically the council um, sort of launched its digital strategy back in November 2020, um, and basically with a four years worth of uh, sort of investment agreed at that, part, uh, that point in time. Now, obviously at that point in time, uh, Members will recall uh, that we were right in the uh, sort of midst of uh, the uh, sort of COVID outbreak. But at that point in time, you know, the council was still trying to do um, uh, some sort of concept of business as usual, as well as obviously dealing with um, a, a very serious pandemic. Um, so the council sort of remained bold at that point and, and went ahead and sort of published the strategy. Um, Basically, the program um, involved um, a series of investment um, with savings to be delivered uh, down the line. And basically, that upfront investment is obviously an absolute prerequisite to, to achieving those savings. Those savings were uh, dependent upon the council working together uh, to create efficiencies across you know, many, many services um, you know, it would have um, sort of better impacts and uh, outcomes for residents. Um, as we sort of moved out of the COVID uh, sort of period and, um, you know, started to uh, sort of review where we were coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, we looked at this particular program and we realised that the, uh, the, the fact that this was sort of badged as digital was a, a little bit too narrow and really what we were looking at was actually rethinking services in the digital age you know that we live in at the moment so this is about re, you know rethinking you know the way that we undertake and deliver services right across the board um so so hence that that sort of rebadging uh, sort of taken place and you can see that now um, and how it aligns with our uh, new corporate plan our greenwich and you'll see in one of the um, one of the uh, missions uh, within the corporate plan about being an adaptive organisation. Uh, to put it quite uh, sort of bluntly, um, if we look at the way that the finances are in the local government sector at the moment, um, and we hear about this every day, um, there are lots and lots of authorities out there 
and we're not just talking about those that um, you know have come to the news in the forefront for particular reasons, but a large number of authorities um, who traditionally have been well run, but um, now are finding themselves, you know, having been sort of structurally underfunded for a number of years, um, you know, finding themselves in a position where they're actually putting their hand up and saying. You know, we've got a ma they, you know, they've got a major financial problem uh, coming, and essentially, there's an argument that says the vast majority of councils are probably on a list, you know, effectively in a list somewhere, which says, you know, there is systemic structural underfunding in the sector. So, councils can either just carry on as normal. Uh, doing what they're doing, um, and at some point, you know, they will, you know, go along the, the line and they'll run into some kind of difficulty. Or they can adapt and change, and that's what this council is, you know, um, you know, un, you know is, it's, it's underway at the moment. It's absolutely essential. That process has to happen. So... Um, and hence the link to um, that particular mission in the statement. So, as I said, the savings were, um, the, the profile was created back in 2020. Uh, COVID has obviously, you know, went on a lot longer than anybody sort of anticipated. Um, so off the back of uh, effectively 10 years worth of austerity, COVID, very large inflationary uh, sort of uh, pressures as well. Uh, then that impacting upon residents, um, you know, impacting cost of living, um, demand for services unabated, and in actual fact increased in areas obviously after the cost of living. Um, you know, those factors as well as, uh, for example, you know, our ability to actually undertake the change work. So whilst we might have grown some of our uh, sort of change capacity in the organisation, you know, ability to recruit at the moment in any organisation is, is, is very difficult. But there is only so much um, uh, sort of managerial uh, and, and, and to a certain degree political capacity in an organisation to sort of concentrate on so many things at, at one particular time. So the net effect of all of these sort of pressures means that whilst we might have uh, set out some forecasts uh, a couple of years ago about making savings, the key thing about those savings is we remain um, of the view that they are achievable, they just may not be achievable in the timeline that was set out at the, you know, at, at the time they were set out for the reasons I've just mentioned. And that's quite important. The fact is we're saying they're still achievable. Other authorities uh, out there, some are, you know, experiencing similar issues, um, also suffering from, you know, sort of delayed savings. Some are actually saying some of their savings are unachievable. We're not saying that in this case. We're saying there's a very large program of work. Um, it's just going to take time to get through. Now, the table that you have in the report in, in front of you basically sets out where we think we are. We think we're about one year behind our sort of schedule on this. But the important thing to bear in mind is that whilst we have a sort of investment, some of which is up front, the savings once delivered are recurrent. They will save year after year. And as long as those savings exceed the investment, then we have a positive return on our investment. The report um, also goes on to mention some of the, um, some of the uh, activities that have taken place, uh, some of the things that have been delivered so far, some of the uh, items that are in flight at the moment, and, and other things that are, that are to come down the, down the line. Um, and it would be remiss of me to uh, not mention the fact that whilst these are talking about general fund savings uh, in the table, some of the work that's been undertaken uh, by the organisation, uh, in particularly by um, our digital team, has been to the benefit of the HRA um, and some of, you know, reworking some of their processes and, um, you know, um, improving their efficiencies. So, you know, the, there's efforts going in that are, are, are starting to bear fruit um, and, uh, and, and obviously help with the HRA sort of revenue position itself. So I'm going to leave it there and open up uh, to questions.
Got, uh, Councillor Dingsdale. Um, thanks very much, Damon, um, for the report and for your overview of the report. I think what I'm struggling a little bit with is, although I can see the slippage and how last year we, how this year we're projected to achieve what we should have achieved last year, you're still projecting 11.2 millions of savings this financial year, and yet in the appendix there's no numbers against anything. So what I'm struggling with here is, apart from the only number that we have is on housing repairs transformation with savings of over a million identified. So I guess, how can we be confident that those 11.2 million savings are still achievable and we can't quite see where, where they're coming from? Okay, and, and so basically um, what we're saying is that for, so for the current year, we've already got, um, you know, um, sort of two and a half of that banked already because that is prior year activity, so that's banked. And what we said earlier was obviously it's recurrent, so we have that year after year. So the gap is 8.8 .8 for the current year, so that, that's the gap that needs to be made up. Um, now, and, and I suppose this is one of the, uh, I, I, I suppose the issue here is about the timing of, of, of the conversation we're having now. So uh, we're here in September um, and we are midway through a budget process at the moment. Um, uh, when I say a budget process, about for the new year, 24-25. So the... Uh, that the, the council is currently formulating proposals um, uh, regarding its 24-25 budget and beyond, and a considerable number of those proposals are rethinking proposals. Uh, they come under that sort of banner. So um, I, th I think what I'm trying to say is, if we if, if we have if we're having this conversation a few months down the line. Um, I think we were in a position where we would actually turn around and say, well, and here are the actual, um, here are the projects. This is the difference they're going to make, and this is how much saving they're going to do. Now, those, those, um, those projects are currently, you know, they're in design at the moment, um, and obviously they will come forward uh, as part of the budget process for next year, and obviously members around the table will be involved in the pre-decision scrutiny around the budget. Okay. Um, and then your other comment about as long as the investment is less than the savings, we're obviously in a better position. I, I agree with that, but I can't see anywhere in the report how much investment we've made so far to get the savings that we've got so far. Yeah, so... Um, uh, basically, the the investment is that set out uh, back in November 2020, um, and that's the paper that was approved by Cabinet uh, back back at that point. And what we have there is roughly five million of of revenue investment, um, and obviously that revenue investment is an annual amount. Um, and then it's predicated on the fact that there's also a one-off capital investment as well, uh, which from memory was about six, I think. Um, and then if we're basically saying that the target here is to achieve 17 on a recurrent basis, um, then you know they, they are they are sort of the metrics that are in, in, in there. So there's five million a year, but you, if you're if you're actually um, returning 17, then you're actually, you know, um, you're saving more than you're spending each year. Um, and that's even accounting for the fact that there's a six million capital one off at the beginning as well. Okay, so with that in mind, when do you project that the investment will equal the savings and therefore we will be making recurrent savings? Okay, I, th I think that's going to depend on the exact profile of uh, the proposals that are going to come forward as part of the budget process. Um, but effectively, I think what we can what we can say from what we can see at the moment um, is that we are literally about one year behind schedule. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of governance questions first from me. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, the first governance question is just that, um, that kind of bigger question of 
how is this being driven through the organization? So in a previous challenging period, there was, I think they were called the financial recovery board model. Um, is there an equivalent for rethinking services? Who's involved? What's the kind of member involvement? How is it being, how are you driving the agenda through? Yeah, so the, I, I think the model you're referring to was the budget recovery uh, boards, and they were brought into being um, basically to look at um, uh, sort of service pressures, uh, overspends, and develop um, uh, sort of action plans on how we could actually sort of turn those around. And, um, uh, you know, they obviously took place right up until uh, sort of COVID uh, broke out. In terms of uh, how we're managing this sort of process, I mean, it's not a budget recovery. It's not, it's not in that same uh, uh, sort of style. So what we have is um, you know, directorates, um, you know, each of the directorates out there have the, you know, formulate their proposals, bring them back in, uh, the senior management team uh, sort of review those, and then they're driven from there. So we're involved in conversations um, at, the senior ma at the senior leadership team in terms of more, what is the progress on those on those proposals, um, and keeping track to make sure that they're actually, you know, going to. Um, so, for example, the ones that we're looking at for next year, um, you know, we are literally you know, making sure that all of those proposals are being developed, are going to be ready. Um, and are capable of delivery. So that's the forum where that, that conversation is taking place, is in a management space. So, so there's no separate governance structure for rethinking services. It's, it's the MTFS, effectively, governance arrangements through the, the management structure of the council? To a certain degree. Okay, thank you. And a second question is, um, uh, you know, rethinking services, there's sometimes, I think, a misconception that these are cut. Uh, you know, however carefully it's explained, I've heard this sort of concern about cuts. And as you've said um, here and before, uh, the program is about delivering better services for less, better outcomes for residents. Um, but how is that actually assured? Um, so the second governance question is, what are the checks and balances to make sure that a, you know, a project comes through, a rethinking services program, it goes through the governance management structure that you just described, the investment is made, the savings start to be realized, who is asking at the end or, or during the, the implementation of that project, well, are outcomes actually better for residents or have we just kind of accidentally cut something? Uh, so, for example, I suppose if we take the council tax online sort of project, um, so that started off um, in terms of the, sort of the case comes in for, you know, the investment in the first place, which says, well, you know, what, what are we seeking to achieve there? Um, and that was about improving accessibility uh, for residents, um, uh, but also reducing uh, the handling um, uh, the handling rate by staff as well of, of, of queries. Um, so that's that's effectively the business case that sort of comes through uh, sort of on day one, then goes through a project. Um, and basically on that one, our digital team then works with uh, the the service. Uh, they work hand in hand on on developing uh, and, and so almost co-producing what the outcome, uh, sorry, what the what the redesign is. Um, and then at the end of that process, now that process hasn't ended, a phase has ended on that one, there is more work to be done. Um, but at the end of that process, um, it's then sitting down um, with the service, so uh, the digital team to sit down with the service and say, right, have we delivered what was, what was set out in the first place? Some of the metrics we've got in here um, show that some of that has actually been achieved. So we did get an uptake uh, in direct debits. We have, you know, significant number um, of people who now have um, their account, which they can now access their council tax account. Um, you know, record numbers of, of people sort of accessing, um, you know, their, their accounts. 
the more difficult part of this is some of the efficiencies in inside the organization because like, you remember i said that this was to cut down on some of the handling time so for example somebody just wants to know what's the balance on my account um, can i set up a dd uh, for example now um, we know that we know that we've had an effect quantifying that is actually quite difficult um, but some of those measures speak for themselves yeah, and, and so without getting into the specifics of a measure I guess the question was more about where does that where does that conversation take place you've said there isn't a separate rethinking services sort of board governance structure fair enough it goes through the it's in the main stream of the, the organization is it is that that same group of people is there a point in the process where they say, you know, at midway or at the end, have we actually improved outcomes for residents? Um, I think because a number of these um, are, are sort of, you know, they have multiple uh, sort of phases to them. Um, I don't think we've been in a position where we've actually been able to sort of sit down at, at any stage and say, right, we've now got our whole list of items that have completely finished. Um, because the vast majority of them have several phases. The council tax one, bring, bring back that example, it's got, it does have a, a discrete first phase. It has had some uh, sort of positive um, outputs and we can quite clearly see those. But there are more phases to come um, because we need to bring out, um, for example, how people can make instalments and things like that and do that by themselves as well. Um, I think until we make a little bit more progress, then I think we're at a point where we can actually go, right, now let's do the measurement. Because you want it to be over a reasonable period of time as well. Because you want, there's no point going in doing something for three months. You're not going to see that change in that period. So there is a stock take to come. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, obviously bringing that back here at some point in the future. So on that point, without taking up any more of the meeting, I wonder, thank you, um, I wonder whether that's a valuable role that scrutiny could play after sufficient time has passed. You know, what I would like to see is, uh, as Councillor Dingsdale said, some numbers attached. Um, this is how much was invested. This is how much has been saved. This is how we've improved outcomes for residents. And these were the adverse effects, if any. Um, because my, my only concern about not having a separate governance structure is that last bit of the conversation might accidentally never take place. Um, not intentionally, but that, that's easy to see that getting missed with all the headwinds that the report talks about. So just as a suggestion, Chair, perhaps we, we, ought, we ought to play a role in that um, you know, with a bit of constructive challenge in a year's time. So would you see that coming as a, uh, a, a report maybe closer to budget time? Well, taking into account Damon's point about enough time needing to pass, I feel like it's probably one for next year's work programme, if anything. Um, I, I think um, when it comes to pre, yeah, I mean, your decision, but um, pre-decision of scrutiny is going to be quite focused um, on, on, on budget matters at that point, and then we'll come back as a standalone, a bit like we're doing tonight. Yep, I'm happy to sort of support that idea. Do you want to bring it back as a recommendation towards the end of the item and we'll, we'll look at it? Uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Somewhat building on what Councillor Hartley was talking about in regards to monitoring. So it looks like when we look at 4.9, we've built some good foundations to build on as part of this rethinking services. Um, and I wonder how we then grow on that. So if I look at the remote working capability, have we been able to reduce or avoid increased office space, for example, by deploying that. Um, same with the meeting rooms. How do we drive up the kind of self-service element at 33% on the service desk to kind of reduce, re refocus or redeploy there? Um, so how does that ongoing, so, so we seem to deliver, but where is that monitoring of the ongoing, you know, almost sweating those foundations more to get more value out of them occur? Yeah, so the, 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 the remote working capability, um, uh, I mean, you know, clearly um, has, 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 has enabled much more flexible uh, sort of working uh, in, in the organisation. Um, 
And I think, as we've, we've said on here, you know, one of the other things as well um, in terms of the upgrade has been the move to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, has been to the use of Teams as our telephony as well. So that was, um, you know, taking that a stage further, which is right, okay, so we've now enabled um, a really significant number of, um, of our staff to be accessible in, in, in different locations. Um, why are we paying for fixed line telephony, for example? So that's an absolute classic example of, right, now that we go to the next stage. And so literally now, I mean, if you look around um, on, on my floor in the Woolwich Centre, the, the handsets have gone. So that, that's, that's, that's delivery of that, uh, that extra step. There is, there is then sort of, you know, further work. Um, and, and again, there are all, all manner of things, you know, to, to be considered. But, you know, we, uh, sorry, um, you'll have been aware of our sort of future of work principles uh, that we developed during COVID. Well, we're now basically moving into the, you know, the, the, the second uh, sort of phase of that. Well, that, that was our initial view. Now, now what's our view at this point? And what does that mean? Um, and what does it mean for work and where it's undertaken um, sort of going forward? So those conversations are definitely taking place. Um, I think, in, you know, in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, sort of the meeting rooms and, 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 and things like that, um, you know, again, that investment has enabled people, you know, to, to have, you know, they will spend more of their time potentially you know, here, not having to travel, not incurring expenditure, um, you know, not having to use cars and, and, and what have you for transport. So that's, that's definitely a benefit. Um, but, you know, there is, there is more to come. And certainly what we're doing, um, if we go back to your original point about the, uh, effectively the service desk. So we are continually redesigning um, or reshaping our sort of digital and customer service teams at the moment. Um, you know, to take account of the fact that we are modernising as we go. So, yeah, at the end of the day, people never had that ability to sort of just, you know, uh, electronically just raise an issue, raise a ticket with, 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 with the desk. So we've now, um, our service desk has now been uh, sort of redesigned accordingly to take account of the fact that, you know, well, how many people do you need to actually take a physical call? And uh, my own personal experience of this as well um, is that, you know, it's, I mean, it's great. You get visibility over, you know, uh, the fact that you've raised a ticket, you know the status of your ticket, um, um, you know, somebody was engaging on it, you know when it's been resolved and you can actually sort of move on. So the product's quite good. It's delivering savings um, and we're realising them. So, and and I would presume then that you track those savings and when, I, I suppose it's how do you claim them as part of this program, right? So if, as an extreme example, if we were able to sublet a floor of the Woolwich Centre because we had more people working remotely, would we credit that to this program or would it be something else? Yeah, so for example, I mean in, in the table, some of the redesign that we've done um, is, you know, in terms of the services, is is actually in that in in that table in there. Now, in terms of sort of going forward, um, if we think about the fact that um, you know, we at the moment we've got uh, a building at the moment which has got a number of floors, and it's you know it was designed that way however many years ago it was, um, you know, it was well over a decade ago uh, that that the building was moved into. Now, we utterly need to rethink, you know, uh, as, as we say, the way that we do things, and we are clearly already doing things differently. So, any opportunities that come from that would absolutely count. Councillor Taggart Ryan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, sort of building on um, Councillor Williams' question. On the in-flight and planned work, so understanding correctly, we've only achieved 21% of the savings at where we thought we'd be at this point. 
So how is that impacting on the planned work that's upcoming and how are we restructuring that to take into account that we're not where we thought we would be? Yeah, and um, absolutely uh, right, right on, the, on the question. And the basically, if we go back to one of the questions about sort of governance, um, if I look at the sort of projects that are coming through at the moment, what we've done is we've developed a framework for prioritization. Um, and certainly one of the key aspects at the moment is those that are going to deliver the quicker financial uh, sort of returns. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that really is a priority for the organization to ensure that we get, get those savings delivered early. So there might be things out there which might be easier. Um, there might be things out there that many people want, but um, one of the, the, the big priorities is to make sure that we get the financial return. So those projects are being prioritized. So there is, whilst, whilst there are things that are in flight, those things that are in flight um, have been through an assessment process, which is basically, do you keep it going? Um, do you put it on ice? Um, uh, you know, you, could, you, you can, you can uh, sort of terminate things. Um, so that process, uh, you know, that happens on a fairly regular basis. Just to follow up on that, could you perhaps give us some examples of these quick wins that have been prioritised? I mean, we have a list of things on, in the, the book, perhaps reference to that. Yeah, so um, I think I would actually say, I mean, whether we're talking about sort of the in-flights or what have you, um, some of the council tax items are actually some of the quicker ones um, because it's developing the changes that are needed there. Um, we've actually got uh, the platform, you know, up and running. The first phase is up and running. So now it's incremental um, and it's just building upon that. So that's an example of something that we could progress with um, because it's not about actually starting from scratch and you know, creating the infrastructure uh, to move on. Um, but you know, um, the housing, uh, housing repairs uh, sort of work uh, that's been going on um, is absolutely fundamental to the service. Um, you know, that particular service is, is overspending uh, at the moment um, but it's quite clear that there are different ways of, of working and arranging things. That, you know, the work that has been done there is clearly going to uh, sort of generate a benefit. So that item is carrying on. That is one of the priority items. Um, others are a little bit less clear. Um, I mean, assistive technology, um, that one at the moment, for example, um, there's a lot of work that's been undertaken so far, which is building the business case for that one. Um, and we're due to, uh, due to see uh, the actual proper business plan for that very, very shortly. Now, the potential for that one is, you know, f again, for an investment, uh, we could actually see uh, a return which sees, um, you know, a reconfiguring of pathways in adult social care. And, and a move away from some of the higher cost pathways into lower cost. Um, we're all very aware that social care, you know, demands and pressures are, you know, unabated at the moment. So that's clearly an area that we really want to focus on. So that's just a, 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 a you know, sort of two or three areas, uh, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things we're thinking about. But clearly, if you've got an investor save proposition, we are gonna be looking at that very closely. Uh, thank you. Just one final question. Um, the SEN travel, obviously it's a key saving if parents choose to um, organise this themselves. Forgive me if you do not know the answer to this, but is that going well? Are we seeing an uptake of this offer? So, um, the I think the process... Um, 
uh, to bring this into sort of being at the moment, I think the I, I think we're at the point where we we're literally about to go live with the formal uh, sort of changes. I know there's been a number of volunteers who have come forward and have actually um, uh, been trialing trialing this uh, to date. But literally, uh, we're at the point where this is going live now. When this was set up as um, uh, a, a sort of proposal, it was always done on the basis that it would be something that came into being halfway through the financial year and towards the start of the academic year. So it's too early, unfortunately, to say at the moment. But, you know, our modelling for this was predicated on a relatively small cohort. But let's see where we are. And as we say, if we're back here um, at some point in the next municipal year, um, we, can, uh, we can review them. Thank you. Councillor Hartley, you wanted to come back in? Thank you, yeah. Um, I just wondered if we could just go back to the figures um, in the main table, 4.7. Um, the one-year slip, so basically we're saying now, 2023-24, is that going to rise above 2.4 million? You know, we're halfway through the year. What, what would you expect that to be at year end? Yeah, well, we're just approaching the halfway point for, for the year. So whilst there'll be an increase in, in that figure, I, I'm not in a position to sort of forecast what that's likely to be at the moment. Um, and, you know, obviously the maximum exposure is 8.8. .8. That's what um, obviously went into the budget uh, sort of process back in February. Um, um, so it will, you know, it, it will be a figure above that, but at this point unable to say. Um, but what I can say is that, you know, the proposals that we are currently working through at the moment, now the majority of those will be for sort of commencement in the new financial year, but some of those could start sooner. Um, and if that's the case, then obviously that brings down the gap. So I was just thinking back to the budget setting process, and I understand the narrative in the report, you know, um, COVID, delivery of cost of living measures, other headwinds, it calls it in the report. I can understand why that has led to delays between 2020 and 2023, but in, in thinking back to this year's budget, 2023-24, you know, that some went into the risk reserve to ensure against continued delays. But it feels like we haven't really seen much progress at all from that position in April. I think the problem is the whole program as a whole, um, you know, has slips. And if, you, if we think about the, the investment program that we've been through, we have built, um, we've built a team basically from scratch, built it from nothing. Um, and there's a lot of infrastructure changes that need to take place. So, for example, um, um, you know, moving our data away from physically hosted servers into the cloud. That's necessary steps that need to take place. Um, you know, so we actually get physical resilience um, and, and other sort of security uh, around it as well. There are a lot of enabling steps like that that need to take place before we can actually do um, the pieces of work that are going to make a difference and be visible at the front end and deliver those savings. So some of that infrastructure um, sort of work has slipped. That then just knocks on to everything else. As I said, there is only so much capacity in the organisation to do things. Um, they're being done. It's just knocking on. Okay, so final, final thing then. Um, there was eight plus million pound that went into the risk reserve um, in the budget. That was just in case there were further delays. It, is it fair to say that, you know, the delays have been worse than you thought when you were last here for the budget setting process in April? I, I, I think uh, given that we've still been sort of fighting cost of living and inflationary pressures, Again, I'll go back to the point about having to deal with, you know, those sort of issues is consuming a lot of time in the organisation. Um, and therefore, things will slip a little bit more, you know, than you would have anticipated. Um, so, you know, I'll go back to the point, um, you know, 8.8 .8 was the maximum exposure. It will be a figure that's less than that 
we'll see what it is. Um, but I know that we've got a whole batch of sort of proposals, as I said, coming down the line, um, which are really going to significantly eat into that. Um, and hopefully we'll be in a position where we can demonstrate that, you know, these savings are going to be made um, just a little bit longer than anticipated. Oh, has anyone wanted to come in with questions or do we want to go back to Councillor Hartley's recommendation, which I felt like the feeling in the room was we would be keen to support something around that. Councillor, would you be able to sort of go back to it and we might see if we want to build on it or anything like that? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was a really useful session. Thank you to Damon for the report from, from me. Um, if just forming what I said earlier up into a recommendation, perhaps it could be that overview and scrutiny is presented with a stock take report on rethinking services in September 2024 um, with a quantified breakdown of investment made, savings realised, positive outcomes for residents and any adverse effects. Uh, yeah, Councillor William. Uh, yeah, happy to support that. I'd also note for that one, it would be nice. I had some maybe slightly more detailed questions, which I won't bore, but the more technical and probably better suited to Kit, I think, under some of the areas there, uh, not reflecting on your ability to answer them. Um, but I wonder if also we could see a few more maybe officers with relations to some of those things here, like Kit and, and those others, to be able to answer those questions when they come. That would be good. Thank you. Uh, no, I would just to add that I would support Councillor Hart Hartley's proposal. I think we are only part way through this uh, program, um, given the pandemic and the ongoing effects that they had. So I think it's quite right that we continue to monitor it to see its fulfilment or not. Um, perhaps, and I thought we're still seeing the immediate effects of the pandemic because we're only actually one financial year out of it. So um, I think this is a very sensible proposal. Okay, I think we're happy to um, make a, a recommendation on those lines and uh, Nasir will get that. Uh, anything else from anyone or are we happy to move on? Thank you very much, Damon. Uh, very useful. Uh, and we are going to move on to item five, which is the cost of living crisis update. We have uh, Council Oliver and I think Corinne Hammersley and Claire Bennett. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Oliver, if you could give us... Um, I'll, I'll give you a second set up. Thank you. If you could give us a, a sort of introduction to this report and then I think we've got a presentation coming as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having us. Um, so, um, Hopefully you will know me, um, Ma uh, Councillor Maram Nodavar, um, Cabinet Lead for Inclusive uh, Economy, Business and Skills. But I also just wanted to quickly introduce you. Um, I know you've met Corinne before, but Corinne's our Interim Head of Advice and Benefits. But we're also joined by Claire Bennett today, who's our Senior Public Health Manager for Food and Health. So I think today we were going to give you uh, a presentation on food poverty specifically. Um, we thought that was an area that I think there's really great work going on in Greenwich, and I think there's a lot that we can be really proud of what we're doing. Um, and I think it really kind of gives Claire like a chance to highlight the great work that's going on. Um, and I think that fits really nicely into um, uh, then kind of the cost of living report that we're bringing forward. So that's kind of like a deep dive into that section. Um, and there are, I think, probably just worth highlighting, and there's a lot, lot of elements I think that Claire's going to take through that are funded by lots of different parts. And there's like one element in that that's funded by kind of household support that then we'll talk a little bit more about when we kind of hit the cost of living report. So I think without further ado, I hand over to Claire. Thank you. The work in food poverty in the borough, sorry. <laughs> The work in food in the work in food borough, um, food poverty in the borough is huge. So this is trying to give you. Sorry, Claire, can you use the other microphone? Okay, so, sorry. So this is to try and give you as wide an overview of the food poverty work that's happening in the borough as much as possible, with a kind of deep dive looking at the kind of child food poverty questions as per the question. So within uh, the borough, we're quite unique in the fact is that we have a dedicated public health nutrition team um, and food poverty is also recognised within the corporate plan. 
So um, I think this is quite an important scale for people to realise. So this is the food poverty, the food insecurity scale. I'll flick between both terms, food poverty and food insecurity uh, throughout the presentation. So a lot of people think of food poverty as about the severe food poverty, the crisis level food poverty, the type of people who come to the food bank who are desperate for food for that three day, that three day supply. But there's actually a wider food insecurity scale and it could be about worrying about the ability to obtain meals, compromising the quality and the quality and also reducing the quantities and um, skipping meals. In 2018, um, my team undertook a, a food poverty needs assessment in the borough and it was found and, and they estimated that one in 10 residents over 15 years of age were struggling to get enough food. Um, that has now been updated, not within public health, but within the national data set, the Food Foundation found that almost 18% of households in the UK were actually experiencing food insecurity. So those numbers that we found in 2018 have probably increased across the borough as well. So in 2015, we established a food response group within the borough. I am, this specifically looks at food poverty and it's a cross-directorate and external partnership group. So across the council, we have um, representation from children's, um, finance, environmental health, public health. Um, we've also got um, GCDA, local food banks, Roots for Life, um, Charlton Athletic Trust and um, Family Action, who are just some of the partners that are part of that cross directorate and external partnership group. So the three, the three main priorities of the group are to make sure that our residents get a cash-first approach, because this is the most dignified way to, to try to tackle food poverty. Food safety, we want to make sure that everyone has access to a safe diet, and also food quality. So the group oversees the Food Poverty Action Plan, uh, pathways, and we are also responsible for monitoring the level of need in the borough and responding accordingly. So the Food Response Action Plan is currently being updated, uh, but these are the kind of four main areas. Um, so it's about income maximisation, uh, food knowledge skills and food related knowledge and skills, uh, physical access, which is food environments, um, linking advice and support services as well, and also meals for vulnerable groups. So regarding food safety, this is something that we really take, we really put importance on this because just because you can't afford a meal, it doesn't mean that you need to have an unsafe meal. So we make sure we try and make sure that any organisation who handles stores or distributes food uh, must be a registered food business. And we've got a really strong relationship with our environmental health partners on this. Um, a lot of organisations give out dry food and ambient food, and the challenges and say we don't need to be a food, we don't need to be a registered food business. But we live in London. There's pests everywhere, mice. You need to make sure that everybody has access to a safe diet. Food quality as well. So we also have a food quality statement, which we try and make sure that our residents have access to good quality food. Um, during the pandemic, it was, it, it was a, a challenge because there was a lot of food manufacturers who were trying to donate foods high in, in fat, salt and sugar for vulnerable residents. Uh, we try and stop the donations of infant formula and baby food. Uh, we're a UNICEF baby. UNICEF baby friendly initiative, but if anyone requires an emergency supply of infant formula, we provide that. This is to try and protect the babies and it's also to protect the volunteers because in our food banks, we get lots of donations of prescribed milk and lots of milk that's maybe out of date and it's just out, it's, we just try to protect the volunteers because they're not health professionals. Um, and we just support organisations who are su providing surplus food or creating meals with advice on nutritious meals. We had an incident with one of our food banks um, actually received a large crate of ice and sugar and that's all they received from Felix one week. We want to try and make sure that our residents don't get that. So we've provided our food banks with a basic food quality statement that they can provide to the organisations to try and get the best food that we can. So the scale of provision, the provision within Greenwich is huge. Um, last December, early January, we undertook a mapping exercise and there were over 200 different organisations providing some element of food aid or community food support in the borough. The findings were that very few were registered as food businesses or had any food safety in place. 
They were distributing all sorts of food. Some of it was in office drawers. Some of it was a weekly food bank. It was, it was wide and diverse. But a lot of them didn't have reliable sources of food provision, so they were kind of relying on donations from the back of supermarkets or um, donations from residents. The majority were not um, actually referring into existing advice support or Live Well Greenwich, so we went back out and we've done some training with a lot of them to try and make sure that they are aware of the support that's in the borough and they weren't aware of um, Good Food in Greenwich or Food Action Alliances. So Good Food in Greenwich is our food partnership within the borough and this is um, funded by Public Health um, as part of our Food Environments contract um, across the borough. So looking at child food poverty programmes, so this table here gives us a small snapshot of the amount of food work that actually takes place in the borough. So we've got a wide range of programmes for food insecurity, we've got programmes for education, so whether that's early years, the adult learning contract, or our own um, open college network training programme. There's a lot of work um, focused on infant nutrition, and the infant nutrition work at the moment is particularly focused through the funding of the Family Hub, which is taking place at the moment. Uh, within the community, we have a wide range of programmes from food growing, we've got good food retail work, we have an advertising policy in place, um, and also the work that's taken place through the sustainability and carbon neutral. So Healthy Start, some of you might be aware of this, but this is actually a national, um, this is actually a national welfare scheme. And it provides uh, women who are more than 10 weeks pregnant or families with children under the age of four um, with money to spend on fresh fruit, vegetables, pulses, infant formula. Um, and they get this money each week. Uh, within the borough, we've currently got 63% of eligible households who are actually receiving their Healthy Start vouchers. Um, so eligible families receive £4.25 per week for each week of their pregnancy and 8 50 if they've got a child between birth to one year and then 4 25 between the ages of one and four. As well as this, they also get free vitamins um, and these, all the vitamins are actually available at all the children's centres. So because we've got quite low uptake within the borough, we've currently got the 63%. Um, over the autumn, there is going to be an actual communication strategy and a plan in place to increase the uptake. So we're going to do targeted promotion to all eligible households. We're going to support local businesses on Healthy Start to make sure that they actually accept the, voucher, uh, the vouchers. And there's also going to be a targeted promotion regarding the vitamins. Um, the GLA have recently awarded um, GCDA some targeted funding to support with wider um, Healthy Start promotion and uptake as well. Uh, last week, um, NHS business unit finally provided us with ward data. Uh, so apologies for the small um, screenshots, but we've roughly got um, some wards, which is 57%. I can't see it from here from memory. But it's Eltham South uh, with Kidbrook and Holland Fair, which is 72%. Um, so this data has just been rele released last week, so we haven't done anything with it. Um, so we've got that. We've also got the Holiday Meals Programme. So this has been in place um, since 2016, uh, funded by Public Health. Um, so to date, we've, we've provided over 75,000 meals. Um, there are free grab, and grow, free grab and go lunches, which are available for children and young people at all the libraries and adventure play centres across, across the um, every day of the school holidays. Um, so this current contractual year, we've delivered almost 11,000 um, meals. Um, this summer, we actually got some added value. So Felix London, which is the largest, um, the largest surp surplus redistribution charity in London, um, they've res they were able to provide us with some extra food. So GCDA were able to collect fresh fruit and vegetables every day from the Felix Depot down at Deptford. And in total, they collected and redistributed um, almost 2.2 kilograms of fruit and vegetables. And that was a very welcome addition, and that will continue um, for October half term. So on top of that, we've got the Holiday Food and Fun Programme. Um, this is a Department for Education funded programme. Um, 
so it's roughly about £1.2 million a year we receive from the, the, DA, the DOE to try and um, roll this programme out. So this is a free holiday programme for children and young people who are eligible for benefit-related free school meals during Easter, summer and winter. So we've currently got over 40 different providers in the borough. Over the summer, we, um, over the summer there was, was 2,152 individual children and young people who attended, um, and that's the highest we've ever had attend camps over the summer. Also got Child and Triangle Homes, just putting this in here as well, because this is also a, a holiday camp which has taken place. They've been receiving surplus food from Felix London uh, with a small public health grant, and they've been providing food to 80 children and young people each day of the school holidays. The children are learning to cook together, they're also learning to serve up, and they're also eating nutritious meals at the same time. And that, should, that will continue for October half term as well. Universal free school meals. So the mayor announced free school meals for all children in Key Stage 2. Um, this has taken place. There's been no issues so far. Um, I think we're currently at the end of week four. Um, so all the funding has been passed um, directly to the schools. We've currently got one school, uh, De Lucy, who have got almost 100% uptake. Every child in the school except two are having a school meal. The two that aren't are having a packed lunch due to medical allergies. So I think that's really good effort by the school, that they've worked hard to get that uptake. So the meals are funded at 90% uptake, but if we've got any schools who go above 90%, the GLA will fund that difference. So we have community meals. Some of you might be aware of these that take place every month. Um, so these are meals, these are a hot meal that takes place across the borough, um, prepared and cooked by a group of volunteers. Um, all using surplus food, so we get the surplus food from Felix, and then the volunteers basically cook, prepare and serve the meals. We roughly get up around 100 residents each week, uh, each month, sorry, and it's very, it's very popular. It's a good way of engaging local residents. Um, some organisations, such as Roots for Life, do a weekly um, community meal on a Wednesday. Uh, we've also got Food Cycle in the borough up at um, Willich Common Community Centre, who do a meal, I think, on a Friday. Um, so we've got the Ambient Food Project. This is funded through the Household Support Grant, which Corin will go into in more detail. Um, so one of the challenges that came through the local food banks and the food clubs was that basically they weren't getting steady supplies of good nutritious food. Uh, it was hit and, mix, hit and miss. So what we do is um, we've given money to GCDA as part of a contract. They've got a dedicated uh, public health dietitian as part of their team who undertake an analysis of space, they monitor all the weekly data, they make sure that families actually have a nutritious supply of ambient food. So currently the organisations receiving food are listed there and that will be expanding over the next few weeks. We're just doing a bit of research into who's got the correct food safety and who's got everything in place. Uh, we've also got food action Family Action Food Clubs in the borough. Um, so these are three, three food clubs. This is where residents can join for the cost of one pound um, for a year. Then they can buy up to 15 to 20 pounds worth of food and it only costs them three pounds 50. So we've got three of them across the borough. We've got Charlton Triangle Homes who also run their own food pantry and that takes place twice a week up there as well. And so we've got the food banks, um, We've got the two main Trussell Trust food banks in the borough. We've got Greenwich and Bexley. Both of them are experiencing high numbers. Uh, they're seeing lots of new people accessing the, the food bank. Um, yeah, and on Tuesday we, Tuesday we had a meeting, our food response meeting, and one of the, the trends that's coming through is that the kind of peak, the kind of peak in um, requests for food normally happens around about October, but they're, they're all saying that September has been the busiest month that they have experienced, so we're going to have to start planning for winter as well. We've also got cookery clubs that take place. This is a public health contract. Um, we've, public health have been delivering cookery clubs in the borough for over 15 years. Um, it's a free five-week face-to-face cookery session. It um, takes place each week, and at the end of each week, uh, the clients also sit down and have a meal together as well. So got that? That's a whistle-stop tour.
some of the work because there is a lot. Uh, I don't know if members got specific questions on this or would. Yep, okay. And then I think we'll hand over to Corinne. So I've got Councillor Taggart Ryan. I was going to speak to the report, so come back to me. Okay, yeah, because I think if we want to do this and then we'll bring Corinne and people. Sorry, Cliff, turn on my microphone. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for that really enlightening um, presentation. It really does show a lot of what we're doing, and I, I suppose. One really broad question, and then a specific one, is do you think it's enough, or do we need to be doing more? And then secondly, you mentioned food safety, and the, a lot of the organizations are, are not registered for food safety, and the, that's obviously not a good thing. How do we, what I couldn't see here, is how do we support them in achieving food safety? Presumably we don't want to shut them down, they're good intentioned. Um, I, I didn't see how environmental hurt, do they enforce or is it more of a carrot than a stick? Thanks. So our, our environmental health colleagues are very much a supportive part in this. So whenever we identify an organisation that doesn't have food safety in place, we... Ah, sorry. Corin's confusing me as well. Um, so environmental health are very supportive and they actually meet with the organisation and they go through it step by step. Uh, the training courses are £10 per organisation each, but it's not very much an enforcement. We'll shut them down. It's working with them um, and trying to educate them and get them on board as much as possible. Is it enough? Is it ever enough? I think the scale is huge. We can always be doing more. I think that it's good to acknowledge that within London, we are always in the top three of London boroughs for um, tackling food, food insecurity. And we're, I think we're always the top borough for our wider food work, particularly the good food retail stuff. So I think we are doing a good job if we take that as a measure, but we could always do more. But yeah, it's huge. Councillor Dingsdale. Sorry, mine's a, <clears throat> mine's a very specific question about the, um, the holiday meals that we provide at libraries. Is there a reason why we don't provide them at every library every day? I'm, I'm just asking because um, I'm an Eltham counsellor and it's in the Eltham library, it's only Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. So I was just a bit concerned about Tuesdays and Thursdays for those children. Thank you. That was basically how it was always set up. And the library staff at the time only wanted it three days a week because of capacity. We are looking at the numbers for the, for the new school year and that is something that we will be taking on board. Um, but that is some feedback that we are working on with the library. But it was all based upon library staff. Councillor Hartley. Thanks, really useful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my question was on the same slide as Councillor Williams' question, um, that really interesting survey of the 200 organisations. Um, one of the points there was that um, they, in general, aren't referring enough to other advice provision, and it's really difficult for organisations to know when to refer, who to refer, uh, who to refer to, so uh, what's being done to address that and to help them to, to refer on um, ex, uh, outbound referrals. So what we've done, um, we've actually set up these new things called Neighbourhood Food Action Alliances. So with that 200 map, we've kind of divided the borough into four. So we're working with them on a kind of smaller basis and they've all been invited to small neighbourhood meetings. And in those, we're calling them neighbourhood meetings, but <laughs> just because it's maybe smaller groups. And within those meetings, we've got um, CACT, avail CACT come to every single one. We've got the advice services. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with everyone together on food safety, on advice, they're sharing knowledge, they're sharing intelligence. And we're trying to be that supportive person to try and support them that way. Uh, okay, if they've got no more questions on food specifically, if, if you'd be able to just hang around in case it comes up again, but then we'll go over to Corinne to speak to the other bit of the report. And I don't know if Councillor Lollawal wants to come in, but obviously work that one out between you guys on that side. Cool, thank you guys. Um, so I think that, I think Claire's presentation gives you a really, really good sense of how much is going on and how much work is going, is going in. And I think it's really good for you to see it just because I think it's one of those things that perhaps just kind of is going on behind the scenes and... And I think we lent on it very much during COVID, that network and all that work. 
and, and even now during the cost of living as well. I think for the, the cost of living report that um, I think we've brought in front of you, I think one of the key things for me, uh, I guess, to highlight is all of this work um, that's focused, a lot of the, the work that's focused in this report that all kind of centres around the our, our, our Greenwich Supports campaign is very much dependent on um, the sort of funding from the Household Support Fund. Um, and I think that the thing that's key to kind of highlight, I guess, um, to members here is um, we don't have any... Um, um, we don't have any reassurances that that's going to continue. Um, so I think that, you, you know, when you're looking at all of the work that's being done here, and, and I think hopefully you can see how vital it is, um, what, would, what we, I think we need is some um, more longer-term permanent funding and reassurances that, 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 you know, in my mind, I feel this should be made permanent. Um, and this is something that I think that, you know, I think the local welfare assistance funding that was ended, I think, back in like 2015, 16, I think we've kind of, that, that gap has kind of re-emerged again. And I think we've been plugging it for some time. And I think with cost of living, it's got a lot worse. Um, so I think that there's a real need for it. Um, um, and I think it's adding real value. Um, and yeah. I think, I think Corinne can, and us, we can basically come here to show you, I think, what great work's been done, but I'll hand over to Corinne if there's anything she wants to add. I think we've talked, to, I think we've talked a lot, so I was just going to say, open to any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yep, if members are happy with that, I'm going to go Councillor Taggart. Right. So I have um, a number of questions, but perhaps I could start with two and come back. So, um, my first specific one was on the um, emergency sports scheme, and it's uh, 4.13, where it says that 55 to 60 percent of all applications are accepted, which means that a significant number, um, up to 45 percent, are not accepted. So, what are we doing wrong here that people who are not going to be accepted are going through this process and applying? Are we making the criteria correct? Are we advertising them correctly? Because it's a significant number of people who believe that they're in need and we're not actually, they go through the process of asking for help and then are going to be disappointed. So that's my first question. And uh, if I may, after follow up after. Just, I think the one, one thing that I think is probably, uh, is worth taking into account here is is how great the need is and that there has to be i guess some limitations as well to the limited funding that we have so i think current will kind of build more on it but um if someone has already applied recently we, you know that's one of the reasons that we're maybe not able to award again in, in a kind of a short period of time um so that i think is some of some of that kind of i guess uh, that number is to do with the vast need that there is and maybe the limits that we have to put on the resource and needed to help as many people as possible, but I'll let Karen provide more detail. So uh, within the emergency support scheme, so the emergency side, which is the cash payments, it's a discretionary scheme. So um, when applications come in, we verify the circumstances that they provide in the application. So that determines in terms of like the level of criteria that we put in, Built by the nature of it being discretionary, um, that I guess it's not completely prescribed who can apply because of that discretionary nature. But when applications come in, we do verify their situation. So, for example, we can check benefit records and council tax records. So, it may be that based on the circumstances, we're aware of other support that's available or alternative, um, or we deem that there is alternative support or they have. Um, so, for, as an example might be that they received their universal credit payment a few days ago and they've applied, so that might not be a situation that we would help with. But what we do with every application that comes in, whether we can help them or whether we can't help them, in that instance, we look to see what wide support would be available for that household. So, very commonly, that would be whether we can support them through the Welfare Rights Service or through our money advice team. Can we maximise income, reduced expenditure? Can we refer them through to live well? Um, or alternatives, would a food bank be most appropriate? But um, So, we always offer that wider range of support, see what's available for that resident. And I said, in terms of the nature of the emergency payments being discretionary, you know, 
that's um, the nature of the variation of the decisions. Um, I think there is something that we are working on at the moment in terms of our website. Can we improve our website content? Can we work through that? So that is an action that we are already working through uh, to hopefully that will help to assist with that as well. I think there's also a way we do get quite a few repeat applications. So it might be that a lot of that is we've received an application that we helped someone a couple of weeks ago and they've applied in a really short, relatively short space of time. It would be unusual that we would help someone frequently for the same situation. But again, we try to utilize the levers that we've got for that wider support. We, particularly with that first application, we do what we can to um, put wider support in place. Sometimes the resident's not ready at that point. Sometimes, it, you know, when they're dealing with emergency, that it's not, we, we can give them all the options available, but sometimes the resident at that point isn't ready or in the right frame of mind to accept that support, but maybe at a later point when that they might be more um, in a place where they can take that support. So it's very variable in terms of, we just have to respond to what they need to that residence at that time and, and see how best we can help them. Thank you. And perhaps it's one thing we need to be clear with residents is that we, we don't do that ongoing support week to week and making that understood better. Um, I just wanted to ask also on the cohorts um, for uh, vulnerable payments. We have the care leavers um, and those no recourse to fund and children on free school meals. Um, one target group that I would suggest that is included in this, but and we ought to work on identifying because it's been left off for, and we've discussed it before, is residents who um, are dependent on electronic medical devices. Um, we can get this information and or bring forward a group for people to come forward who are using or dependent on very expensive pieces of machinery which they're now having to pay an awful lot more for. And so I would suggest that this is a cohort that we ought to consider amongst that group. Um, and I says I'll, I'll put one uh, more question and I'll, I'll let others. Um, but around uh, 4.21, around the hotel budget allowance, so I know this is quite a unique thing that we're doing, um, but I want to ask, is there any plans to expand this? Because those lacking a fridge or cooking facilities even though I know a lot of places aren't doing this up £10 uplift, £10 is not going to help you very get very far per week if you cannot, if you have to consume food on that day. That is like two meal deals. So that's like in any, you know, £2.50 in Tesco's or Sainsbury's or wherever, you've used that up on one day for two meals. So, and so building on that question, are we any plans to expand that? But also is perhaps the cash-based approach the best model for people when they don't have any means of keeping food for longer. Um, I, I have, have a, a resident who's particularly affected by this. He's been there for a long time in hotel accommodation and she cannot store breast milk. So what would actually be in that is not that 10 pounds cash isn't helpful, but whether if we could provide her with a mini fridge or we could provide her with a different form of, of support, then that actually would be better, a way of sterilizing bottles, mini fridges, other support for breastfeeding, for example. I'll just start, and then I think both Corinne and Claire are probably going to come in on that one. Um, so I recent, uh, a few months ago, I, can, uh, I went on a visit to one of the hotels that we're using for temporary accommodation with Councillor Slattery um, before, ahead of kind of launching um, this support. Um, and we saw a lot of, um, the, kind of spoke to residents specifically that are in that situation, which is a really dire one, and saw a lot of what you're saying, the difficulties firsthand, particularly with... Uh, uh, the facilities that they have access to. I think, I think, if I had all the money in the world, I yes, I would want to expand it. But I think the issue that we have at the moment with temporary accommodation um, and the the pressures on there is it's it's. Uh, there's a bit of there's you know I don't, I don't it sounds alarmist, but it, there's a crisis unfolding there, um, and I think it would be. Um, but, uh, we cannot risk making a commitment right now to be able to expand the scheme, if I'm honest. Um, at the moment, we are there is real issues with temporary accommodation and real issues of people having to be placed in hotels, which, as we all, I think, would agree, we, is not really the option that we would ever want to be doing as a council. Um, I just, I think, you know, Corin and team have 
uh, I think with other officers have obviously I'd, like, identified this need and have very carefully kind of planned like how we were going to approach it and budget for it. Um, uh, I think we will have to really be watching this carefully to see what we can continue to sustain. Um, um, and not to mention the fact it's being paid through household support, which, again, we hope it will run again next year, but we don't know. I think the other thing to add is we have, again, where possible, with the, I think as uh, both Corinne and Claire talk about, connect, try to connect with LiveWell, try to connect with all of those other food provisions, so like the community hubs and whatnot. So where people could, they can access, for example... Um, at St Mary's, you can get the kind of like the takeaway meals, and at the clock house, you can kind of like have food there. Um, what I'll do is, I, I know Claire has done lots of work specifically of been looking into kind of the uh, feeding in regards to like um, uh, infants, bottom uh, formula, and like breastfeeding milk. Um, and then I don't know if also Corinne wants to kind of add a little bit more on TA and uh, the, the kind of scheme in general, but I'll let you decide who's best to go first. Yeah, so the whole infant feeding thing is, yeah, I feel very passionate about it as well, and I think it's a huge challenge. Um, so I am working very closely with midwifery and health visiting colleagues um, to come up with what do we do, and I think this is the real challenge. I think that there's a real challenge that we need to put in place. I think there's a training piece that we need to do with our housing colleagues as well. How do we assess people? How do we know how they're feeding their babies and what takes place? So um, Newham are kind of ahead of the curve and they've kind of done this piece of work, but it has actually <laughs> raised a lot more questions such as what happens if the mum is breastfeeding and she expresses milk, where does she store that milk? What happens if she uses, um, what's it called, ready-made ready -made formula? If you buy a big thing of ready-made formula, you've got to use that within 24 hours, so how do you store that? I've got another meeting this week with health visiting colleagues again to discuss it further, um, but we are, working, we are working on this as quickly as possible regarding infant feeding. Like, for example, Healthy Start. Is she eligible for Healthy Start? Does she have a Healthy Start? Um, is she receiving our Healthy Start vouchers? But it is round about the storage. Uh, we had a briefing today for Council Councillor um, Morrow and Councillor Lolivar on the complexities of, all, of emergency infant feeding. I am, but yeah, we are on the case. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, one quick point on... Sorry, to go back to Councillor Lullivar. It's brilliant that we are looking at ways in which these pantries and other things can support those in hotel accommodation, but how can those who are in out-of-borough temporary accommodation in hotels benefit from that? <laughs> So I think this is a London-wide piece of work, and I have been annoying my colleagues across London on this because we are, we've all got the same situation. So we are trying to work together on mapping the food provision across London and how we can share this better, um, especially for the infant feeding situation outside of London and Kent. Um, we're trying to get that all together. So that is a big piece of work that we are working on along with Corin's team. They've covered most of the things I was going to say. Uh, but just in terms of the electronic medical devices, I think what the, the challenges we need as well as that is understanding which of those are on the lowest incomes. Because I would say all the cohorts that we have identified for targeted payments, it's um, the precursor is on the basis of the low income. So I think that's what we need to explore, whether that, how we can undertake that and identify that but in terms of uh, we are currently working on there is a cohort of residents that we are expecting to issue a payment this autumn so through we're working through adult social care uh, so residents who receive a care package and who are on a low income and not contributing to their package and also um, households who are in receipt of telecare and in receipt of means tested benefits so we are potentially going to be supporting some of those households through those cohorts I'm, I'm aware I appreciate it's not everyone um, but I think we need to take that away and explore further but that's just the the challenge I'm foreseeing how do we um, are how are we able to target within that cohort those on the lowest incomes, but we'll take that away. Thank you. So were you, were you wanting to sort of make that as a recommendation or are you kind of happy with that response that they can take it away, Councillor? All devices. Um, can I think on that? That's cool. We can come back to that towards the end. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, firstly, can I commend you on um, 
the, some of the data in this report, particularly around the advice hubs, I think it really, really speaks to that targeted approach we agreed to take as a council rather than blanket and collecting that data. I think it, it's, it seems to me to help identify where the needs are. So thank you for that. So I wondered what your thoughts were on the drop in attendance at the advice hubs that we note in there and what, what might cause that of, have we reached the right people now and they're not coming back or are they finding it, do we need to reinvigorate the campaign to and highlight awareness? What, what are your thoughts there? It's a specific question that one of you may wish to take in 463 where we talk about using council-owned assets and the strategic asset review. There's no timeline attached to that, so I just wondered what that timeline might be. Might not be able to answer it here and now, but perhaps you might. And then there's sometimes a narrative around these things about fraudulent claims, fraud, and you, you touched on it with repeat, which isn't necessarily fraud, it's just misunderstanding. Is that, are there any issues with fraudulent claims that come in? Thank you. I'll just kick start with one or two and then hand over to Corin. Um, the So with the advice hubs one, um, I think, and apologies, I think this is uh, basic, I'm trying to find it now. Um, there's not a drop, it's just the data sets are slightly different. So the first data set is like a 12 month data set and the second one is, is it a six month data set? And actually, if you, when we kind of actually, ah, found the page, um, when you actually look, so it's April 22 to March 23 for the first one, and it's total 1,000, and yeah, we should have made it maybe it clearer. And actually, me and Corinne spoke about this just before. Um, and when we pulled out the actual total so that you could do a comparison from for the April to August, and that would be 809, so it's quite on par. But then Corinne made the point that we had a huge surge of people that came in 2022 specifically for their kind of energy rebate. So if you minus those people, that's actually 462 that came for their energy rebate. So then you're actually looking at an increase from 2022 to 2023 from 347 to 829. So demand's actually up. But yeah, I feel like maybe, it, it, yeah, we, might, we have to change the way we display it next time because if it's confused people. But I'll hand over to Corinne for the rest of it. Yeah, we just tried to do it as year one and then year two are only part way through it. So I think that's, that's kind of, and I'd probably say just in terms of like the trend. So we started the advice hubs in April 2022. And I, like that first week I went around, I was just really glad one person came. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, but since then it's just been a vet, gradually the increase is continued and inconsistent and we're now getting 20 plus residents attending each of the hubs each week um and i think it's you know there's been a lot of work around like promotion and communications you might have seen some things on twitter and <laughs> on the uh, greenwich Intro, but a lot of it's been very much working with community groups and organizations so they go so regularly talk about it, the food response group and, and things, and a lot of it's word of mouth. So we are aware of a lot of that in terms of that um, kind of, it, it's really pleasing to see that people, that residents are aware of it and that they're attending. So, it, it, that, so that's great to see. Uh, in terms of the timeline on the strategic asset review, I think I might pass to other colleagues who might know the answer to that. Um, I think that's one we can come back on. Yeah. 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 I guess fraudulent claims, um, are you kind of meaning in benefits in general or specific to like the emergency discretionary support we're talking about? You I, I think the emergency discretionary support okay. just is it not benefits overall. So I guess the, so I'd say in terms of the emergency discretionary support, um, you know, we do, um, every application we verify as much as we can um, so you know we we look through our benefit records see what we have understand all their council tax and often it's about previous applications and things that we can see so I would say that um, I think I've got a very experienced team and they know what they're looking at they know what they can see um, they're very skilled in that job which to be honest out of all the teams that I manage I would say they have the hardest job they are absolutely on the front line and it's a really difficult job because they don't say every, yes every time and then they are providing that. To be honest, we had a, a really difficult winter in terms of the level of demand we had from residents' support and, in, and residents in very difficult situations. Um, the can sometimes be situations in terms of... Um, you might get one neighbour make an application for a situation and then you get, like, next 
you, you realize that you get several in the same street making the same application in the same situation so but then we would verify that situation around that and i think probably linking back to the question on repeat applications i think so sometimes we may get an application a fresh application uh on, on a date from a resident and then they might apply again in a couple of weeks time or the, even though when every application an award is made it's explained it's a one-off the, the, the ongoing support is not there um some, sometimes it goes that, that like just try and push in the look in the scheme i think there's just a variation in scale on that i would say it's unusual you know I think we do get applications people trying to look. I would say we'd probably, I think we are skilled in being able to spot those in terms of how many of those go through. It is a discretionary scheme. Can I say that, you know, sometimes a client can be very good in pulling one of our, well over our, our eyes. But again, by it being a one-off scheme and a one-off payment generally, you know, it's not going to be a scheme that they can come back to regularly to utilise it. We, we just, that's not the support we provide in that way. And just to, I guess, close on that, I think, as Corinne's saying, I think it's quite rare. But then I'd say the risk of not having something like that, and you look at it at the other end, where there is somebody who is genuinely in an extreme, like, in crisis, I, you know, I would, I, I have faith that the team are doing the right thing. One more thing. I think um, we recognise that the fact we have a scheme that we provide a cash payment and cash support as well, I, that is more attractive, and that probably does attract more people who try to gain from that. But um, I think even with that being the case, I think we are very proud and very much um, want to protect and a provision that we do provide cash support to those residents. You know, we very often see the arguments, and we see it um, all over, you know, we are one of the minority of authorities that in providing emergency support, we provide it in the payment in the form of a cash payment. But we think that is so important in terms of the dignity and support that we provide to residents. It also enables the residents to, um, they make the decision. So if we award them 50, if we give them 50 pound in a Tesco voucher, their options are going to Tesco, which is not very good for the residents in Eltham or Thamesmead to be able to get to Eltham to take advantage of that. But if we can give them a 50 pound cash payment that they can collect in any of the post offices in the borough, which gives a, a wide... Also, then they get the cash that goes into their purse. So they can make the choice over case of this, we're going to split some to gas, some to electric. And actually for me, I would prefer to go to my local corner shop because that's going to get me the food that I particularly need on this time. Um, and so the feedback we get in terms of having that, even where there are some risks around that, but I think that it's worth having those because I think the value we give to residents and support, I think is much more important. And I think we will, I have regular conversations with all kinds of people across authorities and they ask, why are we giving cash payments? And I'm like, I think it's the most important form of support. If it's good enough for the DWP with their cost of living payments and universal credit, you, the housing elements, so residents have got the responsibility to pay their rent, I'm like, well, it, I think it's good enough for us. So that's if you get those questions, because I think they come up quite a lot in terms of why is, emerg why is emergency support not a fuel voucher or a food voucher or in kind? And we have that backup provision through the ambient fuel project. Are we, that, just complements the cash first approach that we have. But sorry, I think I'm on my soapbox a bit about this. Uh, <laughs> but I just, I just can't emphasize that point enough how important it is that we've got that cash first approach. We should be really proud of having that in Greenwich and we should protect that as much as possible because I think it's such an important element of the support we provide to residents. Thank you and thank you so much for your passion in that answer. And it actually dovetails into one question about the food poverty piece, so we did come back to it, as the chair indicated, we might on the um, healthy start card, because obviously that's not a cash first approach. And I wondered, you know, firstly, what shops can that be using, because it doesn't detail it, and can we bring any pressure to bear to pivot that to a cash payment that perhaps we could administer or anything like that? Secondly, you mentioned the work that your team does on the front line. What support do we provide them when they have to make those decisions to say yes or no? Thanks. Um, so Healthy Start is a national scheme. It's um, very much a nightmare scheme, to put it politely. <laughs> it went from a paper. It went from a paper voucher to a digital card last year. 
and um, with that change there was a huge drop off because it meant it's huge, it's just filled full of flaws. It's only now that the uptake is starting to go to the way it is. The problem is at the moment is that any retailer who accepts MasterCard can actually accept Healthy Start vouchers. Um, it's really hard getting data, so we do not have any idea of what shops in the borough currently accept Healthy Start vouchers. Um, when it was the paper voucher, we had a lot more control over it and we knew who was receiving the money. Um, there is also an issue with it at the moment is that it is open to fraud because anyone who accepts a MasterCard can accept a Healthy Start payment card. It's like a kind of debit card. But that Healthy Start voucher can be spent basically on anything. It should be ring fence for fruit, vegetables, milk and formula, but it can be spent on anything within the shop other than alcohol, tobacco or betting, I think is the three things. I am... Um, yeah, it's just a national scheme and our hands are tied. It's throughout the whole country, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England. So it's, and it's run by NHS Business Support Unit, but it's huge. I think one of the things just to add on to Claire's point is I think um, just from uh, the briefing I had previously, it is frustrating that some of the changes I think um, uh, have made the scheme worse. Um, and I think the numbers that you see on the low uptake uh, in some sense are due to more to that. I think it's a scheme that had been outsourced as far as I understand it. I think it was Serco. Um, and it just doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't really, it, it kind of removes that local uh, element that I think we would love to be able to, as you say, access that data um, and work to make it better. Um, and I just think there's a lot of flaws. In, so we're working with a slightly broken scheme. Okay, then in terms, in terms of like support for staff, so um, I think we um, probably, there's a range of different things in, in different ways. So very much in terms of I think we've got a very strong team and it's just that supportive team network and supporting staff when they're going through when we have that difficult call. So we're very much kind of very much ensure that we've got that supportive environment around. Um, there's some specific some specific things we put in place uh, with the team in terms of thinking of kind of self-care and resilience training. So that's something I ensured that we had in place uh, earlier this year. Um, ensuring that we've got just we kind of reviewed and updated what our processes were and what we were dealing with residents when they were kind of verbally abuses or, or difficult in terms of what we're going to do in that, that situation. So we very much reviewed that and strengthened that as well. So it's a combination of those elements. Um, I think, and as well as we're having a clear policy and approach for when um, we do say no to a resident and, and it kind of links into the wider support we have in place as well so very often when we're saying no we can say no but we have this range of support we've got in place as well so I think it, it's it's factoring all those things things into account but it doesn't take into it still doesn't mean it, it's still a difficult job um, even though the emergency support scheme mostly that team are dealing they're dealing with queries over the telephone but that's so it's one step removed you know Similarly, you know, there can be challenges at advice hubs as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's difficult. And we're just very much we're seeing, you know, I have to say that with the, particularly through the emergency support schemes, we've had the scheme for 10 years. This center, I think, was the most difficult. And I'd say that's a reflection on the challenges that residents are seeing, the cost of living. And I recognize that, that most of the time it's really because you've got a really desperate resident on the other end of the line at a difficult situation and so it's really balancing the need of staff and protecting them and having a recognition that really that, you know that the resident's just in that desperate situation so it's hard it's really hard uh council dingsdale thank you um this report was like depressing uplifting and worrying in equal measure um, depressing, obviously, because of the amount of need there is out there for our residents during this cost of living crisis, uplifting because of all the work we're doing. And then my question goes to the worrying aspect that you mentioned in your intro about what are we going to do about if we don't get any more money from the household support fund. So my, my question was, how much does all this cost? So how much do we get from the household support fund and how much do we spend? Um, just so that I can understand the, the scale of the potential issue if we don't get any more money from government to support this. I'll start and then I'll hand over to Corinne. Um, 
I'm going to let I'm going to let Corin do the numbers. I know it's in the millions, and I know there's been multiple tranches, but I'm not going to. There you go, 4.7 billion. So we've had about like kind of four tranches of it so far, um, and ultimately, I think it would be fair to say that if we don't get it next year, a lot of the work that is kind of indicated in here will not be able to continue. So if it's four tranches of 4.7 million, sorry, what time period is that over? Is it, so that's each year, and we pretty much spend all of that on what's, out, what's in this report. So, so we've had, we're currently in tranche four, and this is a 12 month uh, uh, period, so it's 4.75 million we've had for this tranche four. The th previous three tranches were six month tranches, it essentially works out the same, but we say we got like 2.3 million for six months, and so, so the amount stayed the same since 21. Um, most a lot of, so all of the targeted payments, free school money payments, all of that are through the household support fund. So if there's no household support fund, I can't, I can't see at all how that would be possible. Um, the emergency support scheme is a combination. So we have got council funding. So if there was no household support fund, then we would just be able to award a lot less. Probably say about 50% of our expenditure is household support fund and half is council funding, um, a welfare rights, um, so there's, we've used some of the household support funding for the money advice work that we're doing. There's a little bit around that. So I think there's some things that are smaller areas that are council funding, others that are, but I think the va probably the majority and the big ticket items in that report are household support funds. So we are kind of very keen and doing what levers we can to try doing what levers we can to demonstrate the value of what we're doing and the impact that's having on residents. So I know that Mary's probably going to talk about what we're doing on that side, but also what routes that we can present to the GLA, London Council's LGA as well. So we utilise all those routes. Yeah, I think that it's definitely an area that we are kind of will be lobbying and writing and to, um, and I think we have also kind of presented um, uh, our thoughts back to government as well when we were invited. Um, um, Corin, I think, spoke uh, about the great work um, that her and her team are doing and highlighting the value that it adds. And it really, really does add um, huge amounts of value. Um, and, and also, um, a huge amount of work has gone to, for example, in Advice Hub specifically to build it. That takes time. It's taken a long period of time to build it and get those networks and for people to be aware of it. If we have to dismantle that, I think it would be um, a real problem um, and there's not really many other places for people to go for, for advice. Thanks. I have um, two smaller questions, which are sort of follow-ups from previous answers you've given. Um, the first one was on cash payments. You mentioned, um, and it's mentioned in the report, that you have to go to a post office to collect those. Um, and I noticed that for care leavers, for example, I mean, it's not a low number of uptake, but for, for free money, it's still a fairly low number of uptake. So I was wondering, is there any other way we could get the cash to, the, to, to people who struggle to get to a post office? Because a lot of people who need that money don't necessarily have their own transport. Obviously, post offices have shut across the borough as well. Um, so just I was a question about that. Um, and on the care leavers point, um, how long do we classify someone as a care leaver for for those payments? Okay, so I think generally in terms of, um, we find the post office scheme works quite well for us in the borough. So I'd say to the, because we use that for emergency support scheme and the targeted payments. So we've used the scheme for over 10 years. Um, so that helps that, you know, it's well established in the local post offices and know what they're do, dealing with and they get it. Um, but also for the emergency support scheme, we can also issue cash payments at the Woolwich Centre as well through cashiers. So we have got that alternative so in ter but in terms of the targeted payments so and um, what we do for the mechanism for those is um, we normally text the code to them but we can also um, uh, we're quite effective and when we see the code hasn't sent text message hasn't sent we will then resend it by email if then after a period of time we see it hasn't been redeemed we will reissue it to them to say so often we might send a text message uh, for October half term and then we see by December they haven't collected it so we will resend the code again by email to really kind of encourage that take up of the codes um, specifically for 
care leavers, um, we work with the PAs and the social workers. The feedback we have from children's services, there is some situations of care leavers that don't want to engage with the council. And so, and that can also impact, you know, we're reliant on the contact details we have for that individual. So I think that, you know, that's the feedback we have from them in terms of, um, why some aren't collected. There's, there's a six month collection point, so sometimes it might be some of them they, um, they're collected a few months later. Or, you know, most of them are, uh, we reissue another one period of time, so sometimes you end up with like, for example, in the free school meals being another example, you end up with three or four coats being collected at the same time. So we do kind of a lot of work around that. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that covers, there we go. Sorry, and then just my final question, which was a follow-up on um, Healthy Start card. Um, so our uptake is about 63% of eligible households. How does that compare with London and nationally? It's above both from memory. I think London's about, I think it's about 58% for London and England. Yeah. Councillor Hartley. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Uh, very comprehensive. Lots of um, excellent examples of how the household support fund and those many millions of pounds uh, that Greenwich has received from it is being used to help people in really targeted ways. Um, I also just wanted to say, um, I don't think anybody can kind of understate um, how hard Corinne and her team work. And also some, something that I've seen in my professional life is there are lots of conversations going on all the time about helping people in financial difficulty um, LGA, conversations with DWP, and Corinne is almost always part of those conversations. So the impact that she has is far beyond the borough, as we've seen with water bills and all manner of other things. So I just wanted to, to say thank you, a uh, huge thank you to her for that. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, Councillor Dingsdale's uh, asked about the, um, uh, the uh, care leavers 87% uh, uh, collection rate, and I understand the answer about um, you know, change of addresses, There's, it's never going to be 100%, I get that. Um, what are the equivalent barriers to the household supported by nil recourse to public funds team where it's an 83% collection rate? Where I would have thought some of those barriers aren't quite the same because there's a more direct interaction with the council. So that's kind of, and, and I suppose what's been done to close that gap? That's my first question. Again, it's that kind of, I think we're reliant on the data that we have from the, from the department for contact details. So um, I probably wouldn't, in terms of like more specific detail from the team, I think I might want to take that away to see what else I can get from the department over what additional thoughts they would have on that. But I suspect that's the challenges that we have around uh, the, the contact details that we've got. We're reliant on having an email address and, or a, and or a, a mobile phone number to be able to issue the details. Okay, thanks. So um, in terms of closing that gap then, um, is that money, so I appreciate we're talking about small numbers, though, you know, as we've just been discussing, £250 to a, a care lever on a low income is a huge difference. Is that going to be available to them if we, are, if we receive contact, if, if in 18 months, is six, you know, what's the time window? Are we going to make sure that that cash is available for people who we are able to uh, engage later on? So officially, in terms of the household support fund, uh, we need to report in that time frame. Uh, but our backup is always our emergency support scheme where we have that discretion. And to be honest, there are, si there are situations that come in, the case come in, and we will use our discretion. If I see that they've, they've contacted us and the previous code just expired a couple of months ago, we, you know, we, we use our discretion around that to make sure that we're, we're supporting those residents. So in, in that situation where it's just that we didn't have the right contact details and they come forward, we do what we can to, to fix it. And as I said, emergency support scheme is always our backup. Great. Thank you for that reassurance. Um, next question is on the council tax support hardship payments of £100 that went to people who aren't um, receiving full LCTS. Um, how did that distribution go? You know, you've had lots of practice at this now after various schemes and things. Um, how, how, wh where's the gap there? And, and wh was there any, where there was a gap, were we applying it to council tax accounts? Yeah, so, that, so uh, those payments were issued at year end in terms of when we uh, went through from last financial year into new financial year and council tax support awards were recalculated for the new year. Where there was that, 
they were not getting 100% support and there was that gap, so the payments were issued automatically. So it was, we are well versed in those payments at this point. Um, it was less money than we've had in previous years because that was funded through central government. So all of that money was issued automatically. The, fortunately, the system was set up to know how to do these payments as well. So yeah, so where uh, residents were entitled, we automatically issued those payments from, from April. So residents didn't need to apply and they got it paid towards their bills. And now that that system is set up, that provides us a great route that we've discussed previously in full council about getting more money into people's pockets, which I'm sure we'll return to. Um, uh, because that, I agree with the cash first approach. Everything you said is, is spot on. Um, on direct debits, so this is slightly mixing the two, but it is relevant to this report. Um, really pleased to see the big uptick in um, council tax accounts registered for direct debit, something I've been banging on about for years, um, 11,000 I think in the other report. Um, I was reading that the Bank of England is paying close attention to direct debit failure rates um, during the cost of living pressures as an early indicator of financial difficulty. And I wondered whether how, it brings up, brings up a kind of wider point, how are we uh, linking all this work into opportunities for early intervention. So are we, as soon as a direct debit fails on, this, on the now 11,000 direct debits we've got set up, how are we pouncing on that to, not, as, not in a rears collection sense, but in a providing support sense? Okay, so um, in terms of the specific work we're doing around direct debit failure rates, um, I want to take that away to, to just kind of see and then look at colleagues. But I would say just in generally the work we're doing with, we. It's probably more advanced what we're doing with housing tenancy and we are kind of establishing this with council tax in terms of the residents that are presenting as being in difficulties with rent and council tax arrears links really well with the work we're doing with our money ad advice team. Uh, so it's very much we are work in that situation what we want to do. So for example with um, housing and I kind of don't want to steal housing slender too much because this is their scheme that's going re really well. But in, but in terms of our involvement, um, so the, how the, the hardship fund is to support council tenants uh, to contribute towards their rent arrears. But rather than it just be a scheme where we award the money and there's nothing else around that, what we want to ensure is through the money advice team, we want to ensure that if we give them a support this year, that actually they don't end up in the back in the situation next year. So can we maximise their income? Can we really drill down into the length of their household expenditure so that they're able to afford all of that? Is it that they need other debt support as well in relation to that? So it's that real kind of holistic support through the money advice team. So we kind of probably say June, we were really stepping up in terms of doing that support with the housing hardship fund. We are now kind of expanding that into council tax. So that's not directly saying in terms of the trigger point of failure of direct debit rates, but in terms of the wider work we're doing, particularly with residents. So, you know, when we know they're not paying, struggling with their council tax or they're struggling with their rent, uh, their rent you know, absolutely the situations where we want to get to them at an earlier point, have that advice support targeted at that stage so that we avoid getting to a crisis point later down the line. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for taking the direct debit failure rate issue away. My next question actually was about the um, housing hardship fund, um, which is basically repayment matching, uh, which I think is a great idea, highly targeted, highly efficient way of getting help to the right people. Um, could you just, I mean, without asking you to steal their thunder, could, you, uh, uh, ask, uh, could I ask uh, what's the kind of scale of that pilot? And I think you might have referred to it there. Are there opportunities to apply that principle, that repayment matching principle, to council tax arrears? I would like to say yes for council tax. We'll have to see where, see where that goes. So it's quite... Um, I don't have the specific details to hand, but... So we're only really a few months in. So and I would say that we've probably had 50 to 60 referrals, I think. Maybe don't hold me to these numbers. Uh, around that, in terms of number of referrals from, mainly they come from income officers, but with except from wider pools of frontline staff. Um, we are working through challenges at how, whether all of those engage. So there's like quite a lot, there's really good joint work between us and the income officers where, you know, can we get getting through to them and supporting the resident and actually getting the resident to a point where they will engage with the support. Because... Um, 
you know, it's not easy for every resident to get to a point where they're going to accept, even though we're offering money to help with their rent arrears, but to be really as open and transparent as they need to be of what all they're spending all their money on and, and potentially leading to some quite difficult conversations. So it's that often we're really kind of trying to support, it's a carrot and stick, absolutely, to support residents to get to that point so we can provide them with the support we're able to do so. Um, and then in terms of council tax, yeah. And in a way, there's a kind of some support of that in terms of come, you know, identifying residents that it may be appropriate to consider Section 13 a which is with council tax, is it a situation where we can apply discretion around liability? So although that's in specific circumstances, that applies. So we utilise that route where possible as well. Thank you. And final quick question um, is about the... Um, uh, the uh, advice hubs. So um, thanks for explaining the figures and the, clarifying the figures. Um, I just wondered what your view was on the roaming locations in particular. So um, similar sort of picture, although the um, council tax rebate f effect doesn't actually apply to the roaming centres. And certainly in those early days when on the Cold Arbor we were, uh, you know, one or two people, wasn't a great use of officer time. Just an update on the roaming hubs in particular would be helpful. And then secondly, um, as part of that really, we've obviously got separately um, the welcoming spaces. Um, and it feels like we've got two programs here that are kind of similar, going out, making sure there's places for people to go. And I just wonder, are there synergies we could leverage there um, to get more advice and help and support to people? So with... With the warm spaces, um, I think I think they are. Sorry, sorry. Well, now we've rebranded the <laughs> welcoming spaces. They're now welcoming spaces. With the welcoming spaces, um, I do I do think they are offering something different. Um, I think that kind of social um, connection was something that came across that's really important. I think the advice hubs are brilliant, but they are somewhat transactional in the sense of someone is coming in. Someone came in the other day with a pension credit letter. Um, I thought of you. Um, and um, specifically, they wanted help. So it, it's, it's people are coming in, and um, it's uh, sometimes, you know, they're, they're in real need of help, and it's kind of like that one to, having that one-to-one -one meeting. It, 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 so, I think you know, it, it does feel very different. I think um, the warm uh, welcoming spaces, sorry, um, uh, is uh, is going to be help. Is going to be having like a lot more activities, um, and and some of it might be that some people are struggling with energy costs, um, and it, there is like that need for either food or warmth. But pe what people told us actually, it was the social thing that was more important. So there will, I think, it, they do have slightly different roles, and I think with the, I'll kind of let. Corin maybe add more and then also come in on the roaming. But from my point of view, especially if our resources are quite limited, um, I think that if we can, you know, it's it's if we, you know, it's a tricky one because I think there's value to running them and building them up. But you know, if we had to limit it, I think you know we'd ha we'd potentially have to look at sticking at the court ones. But um, I'll let Corin add more. Yeah, so the roaming hubs. So the roaming hubs, we started those in August last year. And so if they've been once a month, so most of them have just got to the, the, the year. And so there have been 12 sessions, really. So it has taken, I think, pro there's probably not a hugely different trajectory with the weekly hubs, really, in terms of if we looked at 12 weeks into the weekly sessions, probably hasn't been a huge amount of difference. Um, other things we've been doing with the roaming hubs is... To be honest, we've opened it up to also a combination of appointments as well as drop-in, and so that we ensure we are utilising that uh, resource. And, and one way we've been using that is where at the weekly hubs we um, ex exceeded the capacity of how many we can help with that query, we will make them an appointment at one of the roaming hubs. So we found that has been an effective use of those resources. So I think it's. They are going in, all going in the right direction, but I think we have to see what decisions need to be made in terms of the longevity of them. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of warm spaces, the only thing, welcoming spaces, it's my fault, I, re, I renamed them and I still get it wrong. Um, I think within that, what's very, what we're very keen to do is, is really embed live well in terms of with those, and that being the key in terms of, you're right, if someone goes to the advice 
uh, because they, they have a specific issue they want advice about. And I think we're really conscious with the advice hubs. One, we're, re we're really conscious to be really balanced in terms of what council provision is there. So we really, we don't want, it's very deliberate that they're in community centres and not in council buildings. And I think it's very conscious that it's a partnership of vice partners and they're independent. And we don't want to overburden with the whole range of council services we're there to sell, uh, or sell and promote and access to and that kind of thing. So it's just very conscious to keep that balance because it is what we're delivering, but you know, conscious that that's not going to work for some residents or it's not going to en encourage or enable them to go. So we really have to um, have balance. I think going off on a, on a tangent, really. Um, but I think embedding that, Marion's right in terms of the welcoming spaces are going to have a more relaxed, a different approach and a different tone to them. It's really about social having activities, but we're kind of really keen to ensure that the providers that we have are aware of the provision that we have, live well, being the particular key and the easy one really that we can support and taking that forward, actually what we want is for live well to have roaming provision that can they have off, uh, coaches who can attend the sessions as well and just have that just present there to support residents as it's needed. But to do that in a way that doesn't overpower the point of just, just being a welcoming space where it's uh, to support that resident and embed it in the community. Thank you very much. If you have no further questions, I think Councillor Taggart Ryan, do you want to come back to the question about the uh, recommendation around uh, residents dependent on electronic medical devices? Yes, if I might be cheeky and just sneak one small question in. You said we had warm spaces, or welcome spaces in all but one ward. What was the ward that didn't have one? Um, uh, it was Eltham Park Progress, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't think it needs to, this question on the medical devices needs to come back onto the panel, but I would really like to have a response from officers that it has been considered. So I was going to propose that we provide a response to members of this panel outlining whether residents who are on low incomes and dependent on electrical medical devices could be considered as a cohort for targeted payments. Yeah, I think people would be happy to put that. I wonder if also you could, if we could sort of be a little bit cheeky, if you could stick in the answer to Council Hartley's thing about failure rates on direct debits, just as a, you know, so we could get a little bit of feedback on it. But sorry, not to give you too much, but if that's, if that's okay. Yep, uh, Councillor May. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted if we could have a copy of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I think thank you for a very, very useful session. Thank you. I think we've got that in the pack, but we can send it out round right. again. Yeah, but cool. Okay. Yeah, we'll send it. Let's send have a colour version. Thank you, guys. I think we've, I think we're done on this item, so we will release uh, Corinne and Claire. Thank you, thank you a lot. That's been really, really helpful. Really um, detailed report. Thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around, guys. Sorry, just how these meetings go. Uh, item six, we have got the cabinet member update for the cabinet member for inclusive economy, business and skills. That is Councillor Mariam Lolloa. And I think we also have here Pippa Hack, the director, um, Fiona, and I think he's Kevin. Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Councillor Lavar. So uh, obviously, we've provided a you've provided a written. Uh, report which members will have read but if you could speak to some of the highlights maybe also present uh, some of the challenges you see coming ahead but uh, I'll let you speak to it thank you thank you very much um, so yes uh, so I'm joined uh, by 
uh, Pippa Hack, I thought I'd just give you some job titles as well. So obviously, I think you all know Pippa, Director of Regeneration, Enterprise and Skills, but we've also got... Um, no. So, uh, yeah, there's been some changes. So, yeah, they're not in here. So it's not Nessa's fault at all. It's, not, it's, it's ours. Um, um, and we've got Fiona Apio Matanda, who's head of employment, uh, and then Kevin Thorpe, who's head of adult skills and community learning. And uh, Michelle Rankin is not with us tonight because she is, uh, she's going to become a grandma. So she is, uh, yes, so that's why um, there's been some changes. So, um, but yeah, so um, I think, um, I think another long report, but I think, again, another really exciting one. I think there's obviously some challenges ahead, but I think there's really, really great work um, that is being done um, in, the, in the directorate. Um, and um, I think there's some really positive stories in there. It's a really difficult time for business um, at the moment. I think a lot of them who have made it through COVID have then kind of been hit by the next wave, which is like energy pricing and um, those difficulties cost of living crisis is affecting them as well, not to mention interest rates, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a really difficult climate. Um, but I think within that, um, I think there's really, really great work being done across all of the different parts of the department. Um, and I think uh, it's all about kind of you know, supporting local business, supporting skills, employment, supporting our economy. I thought the key kind of highlights that I thought I'd pick on is I think uh, some great work being done on uh, on progressing the inclusive economic strategy is something that I'm very excited about. Um, and, um, you know, I'm looking forward to kind of, you know, when we're kind of bringing in, bringing that forward um, and, and for discussion and consultation. Um, I think town centres, there's a really positive um, story there. Um, um, around um, the work, the execution, the work that we've been doing, which I think has clearly pushed up footfall uh, and spend, um, and um, working in partnership as well to be able to do that and support high streets that are having a really tough time. Um, and, and actually, uh, the empty shops um, element we, is something we might talk about tonight, but we're doing quite well um, in the scheme of things compared to others. Like other, Our numbers are good. Um, they're holding up really strongly on council-owned properties, and we're kind of on an average of slight, slight, even actually slightly above average on um, privately-owned properties as well. So it's definitely an area we're looking at. Um, we're keeping an eye on an area of potential concern. And, and as you'll know, there's huge redevelopment that's going on in Woolwich and, and you know, we're across my portfolio and Councillor Smith's portfolio, um, huge work to invest and support the growth of our town centres. Uh, um, and then I think uh, the UK SPF work as well is something that's really interesting um, uh, and including uh, just pull out one highlight is going to be the neighborhood health uh, neighborhood parade health checks that we're going to look at to do which will ultimately allow us to look across the borough so go beyond those town centers and look at those neighborhood parades that I think all of you in your wards will potentially have and your residents will find really important and valuable to them so we're conducting those health checks so that we have a real sense of where they are um, and I think that puts us in a really good place for future UK SPS funding as well um, and and kind of work that we want to be doing around that um, and then I think uh, employment and skills uh, GLAB has moved back into the old library building uh, and they're seeing kind of uh, people face to face um, uh, we had like a bit of a hiatus I guess with COVID and whatnot and we've had a great uh, we've recently had like a matrix uh, kind of quality kite mark uh, review which has been looking at the work of employment skills which has you know, really kind of like applauded, I guess, the partnership work of, uh, that we're doing. Um, and I think there's, there's a, the, both Fiona and Kevin are working brilliantly together, I think, to support people uh, in their like, in their employment and skills journey. Um, and I think that's something that we can be really, really proud of, of that partnership work. And then I guess finally is our Anchored in Greenwich partnership. Um, that's growing uh, um, and we're working with partners and we're, you know, progressing on, on uh, becoming like a London living wage place and supporting London living wage across our anchor partnerships um, and mapping kind of generative businesses including co-ops and social enterprise across the borough so I think I think it's a difficult time um, but I feel like we're doing everything that we can with the resources that we have to try and try and make a difference um, locally so I'm feeling positive yeah so yes over to you thank you very much uh, Councillor Dingsdale Thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, my first question is on 5.23, and this might be one um, for, for Kevin and Fiona. 
Um, I've noticed that, actually it's in 5.2, at the bottom 5.22 and in 5.23, that the, there's quite a lot of people who are enrolling in, in the learning who are looking for work, but not an awful lot are getting work following their period of learning. So I was wondering, are, we, are they on the right courses for where there are gaps? Um, how are we helping them move into, or is it one of those things that they need to do a lot of courses? So I'd just like to understand those figures a bit more because they're not brilliant. So just, I think, yeah, this is one thing that I think that maybe, and it kind of maybe we can add a little bit more for future ones, because I think it is a bit more about the journey that people are on. So it's not, I think the figures are really, that actually are quite positive. And, um, but I'll let Kevin give you that kind of color of, of, of the journey they're on. Okay, thank you. Now, those figures represent those that move immediately into work upon completion of their studies. Now, obviously, there can be a time lag from completing your study and then getting employment at the end of it. So I, actually, I echo the point made by Councillor Lallava. That's actually very positive, and it's actually quite a high percentage of people. Uh, many of our learners are a long, long way, and so it is, it's about the journey. Uh, so I'm, I think those figures are actually to be applauded. To come straight out of a, a, off of a course and straight into employment is, is a very positive thing. Are you able then to share what the figures were like? So if, if there's a bit of a time lag, if we look at a year after completing a course, what sort of figures tend to be from previous years then? Uh, that's always a challenge. It has been a challenge over the last couple of years because of COVID, uh, and that's had a huge impact upon the figures. That is. So it's difficult to get them very comparable at this point in time, but it's something we're certainly going to be recording and looking forward over time in the future. One thing that might be helpful, I think, is uh, we can probably, you know, um, outside of this meeting, share some case studies. I think that kind of maybe helps, I think, show the journey that people are on. And I think also some of the work that we're doing in our review of uh, our kind of GLAB employment side, I think if we can show those journeys that people are on, it is quite complex. And, I've, and I do mind, I minded that it doesn't come across clearly in the report, so I can understand that. Uh, but maybe that's something we can share after. That would be great, thank you. And then just one more question, if I may. I'm on empty shops. Um, as you know, I've got a big interest in empty shops. There are two empty shops in my ward that have been empty for decades. Um, following quite a concerted campaign this year, we have seen those shops now go up for rent. Um, but I was wondering what, if anything, do we offer to help new small businesses take out leases in those, in those shops? Is that any sort of package that we offer, any support that we offer to help small, like new small businesses, new local small businesses sort of get off the ground and take places in the empty shops? I think I'll start with saying congratulations on the Criterion Estates. Uh, um, uh, I think the campaign of uh, that both you, uh, all wall councillors, I think, have pursued. And I, I do know, actually, our director, Pippa, had also written to them as well. So I'm really excited to see that these are going to be, um, they're going to be put to that. So very, and um, I think when I spoke um, to Pippa, um, we were feeling positive that, um, that we're hoping they're going to be taken up because they're in a, in a great position. So, yeah, just wanted to say that. Um, on, on empty shops, I think um, we have discussed this. I think the, and then I might pass over um, um, to Pippa as well. I think when there are, um, um, within our kind of uh, council, um, you know, properties, um, we, you know, we do a lot to kind of, uh, we do a lot as much as we can to support uh, local businesses and we, with our local business team, we'll support people on that journey. Um, um, and... I think it is a bit what the and we have also, for example, during COVID, when we had COVID grant money, we offered specific grants that allowed people to to support with fitting out, uh, you know, very empty like Shell and Core or any like shops. Um, I would be uh, um, reticent to kind of commit uh, kind of any money for kind of supporting people to moving into uh, properties that are like privately owned. I think again that might just be a bit of a difficult one for us to take on board, but I do think that um we can be promoting them, uh promoting the ones that are let, trying to get it out with our business newsletter. I think we have a property uh listing. Okay, I'll let, I'll let I'll let Pippa come in on that. Thank you. So, um we don't provide a specific package to a business irrespective of whether they're going into council or into a private 
but the business team do provide support and advice, but obviously they're not a legal representative for a business when they're negotiating their lease with a landlord, but they have extensive experience of having supported many businesses over the year. And obviously we're keen to see new businesses start up, but also survive. And you'll see in the report that there is an issue about survival rates of some of our businesses. Now, sometimes you know you need to have some churn, but we don't want to see businesses fail. We want to see businesses thrive. So that's where Mervyn and the team you know, will go and they talk one-on-one -on -one because when they're doing the vacancy rate audit, they're actually having single points of contact with the business team so that's where they get the support so so there's not a specific package but there's support along the way um, and we can direct them to support specialist support if they need it from organizations like southeast enterprise as well or geb you know they're they're the sort of kind of organizations that can support councillor hartley thank you chair i've got two questions yeah the first is also on empty shops Yes, some encouraging news on New Eltham's empty shops after many years of campaigning from ward councillors, uh, pr previous and present, and the community, Rob Sayers, John Killick, who've been working on it for years and years. Um, my question is actually on the bigger principle um, on empty shops, and it's about the levelling up and regeneration bill and high street rental auctions. Um, so it's more than a year since I first suggested that we set this aim of uh, Greenwich being the first local authority in the country to use those powers when the bill passes. The, uh, the bill is about to pass, it's in its final stages, but I checked and the, the rental auction uh, provisions in that bill have barely changed. It's got cross-party support in the Commons and the Lords, so we've had more than a year where we know what's coming. Um, and uh, so your predecessor or your, in, your maternity cover uh, in the role, um, Councillor Highland, uh, uh, agreed for officers to look into how we can pounce and use those powers when they become available. So I just wondered if we could have an update on uh, the work that officers have done on that. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm very much aware of that commitment that uh, was made before council. Um, I actually recently did have a meeting with um, our lead in property, um, uh, property uh, planning um, and regeneration. Um, I think at the moment um, there is still some detail lacking um, from, a, um, from us as a council. Um, and also there's no indication of uh, any additional financial support that would come with it either. Um, and I think it will be a costly exercise to undertake on um, running our auctions for uh, multiple kind of uh, vacant properties. Um, I, I think personally, I were, from the briefing that I had, um, I'm skeptical that it's going to be a silver bullet. I feel sadly, it feels to me, this is my opinion, that it's maybe a more marketed uh, to look in a certain way and maybe the actual reality of the execution doesn't look as uh, robust uh, and maybe as fully funded as possibly it should be. Um, but that's obviously just my opinion, but I might also let... Uh, does Pippa have anything to add on, a, on an officer level? <laughs> I think we need to await the detailed guidance in order to understand how it could be implemented and what that means in terms of the council's resources. But um, the commitment remains to see that detailed guidance. Okay, two slightly different answers. I'm glad that commitment remains to, uh, to, to pounce. I suppose, uh, you, uh, in, sure, and we, we've all got opinions. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got opinions. Um, the provisions are all in the bill, and the point is it hasn't changed uh, in all that time. I appreciate that once legislation passes, there needs to be guidance on how local authorities can implement that. Um, but if I could just reiterate, can we just get that ball rolling? Because I think we could have done more work in this last year uh, to get ready um, based on those conversations that took place more than a year ago. So, but thank you for the, for the answer. The second question is on um, uh, footfall, and which is a more positive picture than the last time we had this report, uh, which is really encouraging to see. I've got a particular concern over the impact of emissions-based parking charges on town centre footfall. Um, and um, um, it's something I've raised before with the leader at Overview and Scrutiny. And so my question is, how, could you just describe how we're monitoring the impact of that? Because it's all based on this assumption that people um, will choose active travel rather than pay higher charges but that's just a theory. So what work is going on to monitor footfall as a result of um, the impact of, on footfall as a result of that policy? Thanks. Um, 
I, I, def the, I think it does actually say in the report that we've, uh, we've got this access to this new data service, which is definitely something that we're going to be using to, uh, I guess, benchmark across those town centres. So it's, it is, um, I, we're seeing a lot of positive kind of results, a lot of which are, and I'm just going to take a slight tangent and come back to parking, but on a lot of like the event executions, they're, they're working um, and it is bringing foot forward and it is bringing increased spend to the town centres. So you know, we know that we can have a positive impact. Um, I think with, in regards to the, uh, the, the, the wider transport strategy, I definitely think it's something that we need to kind of keep observing, um, but we're, you know, very much commit and committed to that direction of travel. Um, but I think it's something that, from a business point of view, I do continue to keep to, to Councillor Lacau about it. And, and also, um, if we do see, and, and I, maybe if I can pass over to people more about um, that, but I think it's something that we have to just keep observing and kind of keep monitoring. And then I do think, in my mind, there are definitely... Um, um, elements that uh, we need to, because I think one thing we have to make sure is a perception of impact versus actual, um, and I think that's really difficult because I definitely, um, when you do have changes that come in in regards to parking um, or any kind of traffic changes, I know from the kind of multiple conversations and consultations we have with traders and retailers, it, it, they're worried, they, they become nervous about it. I think what we need to make sure is that we're focusing on monitoring it and see what the actual reality is, but I do think that we could continue, we can continue to engage. Like, I would love to do more to promote uh, more cargo bike delivery services um, where we can um, um, again you know if that is a part of a concern it really depends because I think it really varies by retailer it's sometimes it's like they're worried about people not being able to stop and pop in and shop if the parking it doesn't permit and then sometimes it's a delivery based concern as well so it's definitely something that's on our radar and observing because uh, I do want to make sure we manage the perception um, and the actual impact but I'll let Pippa come in as well Thank you. So we have footfall cameras, so we'll be able to actually, you know, show longitudinal analysis around it, and those um, that data is available on a monthly basis. We've recently um, bought or entered into the agreement to buy the uh, GLA's Hydrate Data Service, which gives us analysis of spend. So it's the first time we've been able to show you about spend. And we also talk to big landowners. So in, in the case of Woolwich, British Land, they also monitor activity and so we talk to the major landowners um, in the town centres to understand what their feedback is because they have their own sources of data as well so so I'm very confident that we'll be able to give you a picture whether or not it's all down to emissions-based parking will obviously be um, subject to um, some debate and I think that um, what we need to think about is that we do a lot of work to try and promote the town centres so if you look at things like in the report around Woolwich Lates for example the high street work that we did over in Greenwich Town Centre so there, there are things that we can do to try and promote and counter um, any uh, fall if, if there is any that's shown but at this stage it's too early to say. A natural follow-up then, when will you, do you think we could come to a view? Um, and I suppose my just thing is, you're right, that link, you're talking to Councillor Cow, great. I really want to make sure that link is being made and you've given me some uh, reassurance on that. But yeah, wh when might we get a sense of impact, do you think? Well, I would normally say that you need to wait a year to see because obviously there's seasonal sort of um, activity in the high street which you can see via the footfall graphs that you've got in the report so my suggestion would be that you come come back in a year and um, we we can we can continue to provide um, information on footfall if you want it separately but um but I think that uh, we need to maybe ana analyze it alongside our transport colleagues to see what they think's happened in terms of the parking activity and whether that's changed, because it obviously will be, we'll have to see how we can correlate the two, if there is a correlation. And engaging with businesses, I guess, and getting their input. Thank you. I, some of this might be able to come up as well in November when we're going to be looking at uh, carbon neutral plan and um, air quality stuff, so might come up again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the quick one for me, actually. So I'm looking at 4.6, which I find fascinating that the Greenwich economy contributed £5.9 billion to the UK economy in 2020. Um, 
So firstly, how do we arrive at that number for the layman's and for the public watching? That how do we calculate that number? I think is the first question I have. I presume when we say it's down, is that as a percentage of contribution, or it was literally just down 21% from the figure before? And then how do we compare to other London boroughs in terms of that contribution to the UK economy? Okay, I'm going to attempt some of this, um, and some we might have to come back on. Um, so with uh, the 4.6, uh, the 5.9 billion, I'm... I believe these would be it's GVA kind of like data that we'll be using to calculate. Um, so um, this we can share how we're stacking up against. Um, one of the big hits I think that we had here um, was around tourism um, and hospitality. Um, so it's a really big about 17,000 jobs for us. Um, uh, we're hu we were hugely reliant on um, um, international visitors, um, and obviously during COVID that just all dried up. Um, um, and it's, yeah, I think they've really struggled, uh, but there's kind of huge, great kind of like, I guess, work. Um, it's also kind of, I guess, pivoted us a bit. I think if you've read the High Streets for uh, evaluation, it was really interesting to see that we've, you know, looking at that local economy as well. And, uh, you know, I would say, yeah, I don't, uh, when I read it, I have to admit, I identified that I don't perhaps use uh, the Greenwich Town Centre on certain days when I know it's going to be really, 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 really busy. Um, um, and I might default to like the smaller neighbourhood areas. Um, and it's, I think that we are, there is actually concerted work that's being done to bring in that local uh, visitor, even like local could be, you know, even quite from far, from, you know, um, near, you know, not just Greenwich. Um, so yeah, I think a big hit was a, a, a significant part of that. Um, and and I think I think the comparators I might have to come back on. I'd, uh, yeah, and unless Pippa has, knows all this off the top of her head, but if not, I'm just trying to have a look in um, a report I've got in front of me. I think it's a value. Sorry, I think it's a value reduction. But I, but I, can we come back just to be definitely accurate on that? Yeah. Councillor Tucker Ryan. Um, thank you. I've got two quick questions on town centres and then one on um, the apprenticeships. Um, so it goes to five, six, four. It seems of the three um, town centres, it's only Eltham, which is actually seeing a year-on-year -year decrease in footfall. So what is the plan? How are we going to prioritise uh, the development of Eltham town centre? And I might as well just add my, my second point on this as quite close to my heart because I've lived nearly all my life in Charlton. Um, why are we not looking at the Charlton Riverside development? Because the, there is a huge uh, retail outlet there, which is not a parade of shops, near a town centre, but it's considerably adding to the economic activity um, with very high-end shops um, and quite a variety. So I want to stand up and ask, you know, what are we doing about Charlton? So, um, with uh, specifically on Eltham, I think it's, um, we're kind of tracking, uh, but not doesn't have that kind of like huge increase that we've seen maybe uh, compared to Woolwich, um, or significantly compared to Greenwich and Woolwich. I think for those, we had specific funding um, that we were utilising um, that allowed us to kind of um, bring in one is obviously tied to some of the works that is um, coming into Woolwich Town Centre. So some of the Heritage Action, action Zone, for example, and the Nighttime Economy. I think um, that's the Nighttime Economy uh, GLA funding was uh, you know, specifically looking at, um, I guess, having um, you know, uh, Woolwich Works, um, Tram Shed, Punch Drunk, and kind of building on that nighttime economy and what that could look like and what a nighttime economy could look like in Woolwich. Um, it was very much a pilot, um, and we want to kind of develop a strategy going forward. Um, obviously, we'd have to take into account variations, I guess, across town centres about how that looks. But I think that those specific projects were very much pilots that were put into those areas. So I think. Of, uh, I know that we do actually have um, some events planned for Eltham. Um, um, so that we will hope, we'll basically, we will be doing, I th I don't, again, it's one of those things where it's like you don't, it might, it's other department um, 
Um, don't want to steal their thunder. So um, maybe it's some, but the, there are more events basically. We've got events planned for Eltham in the town centre that will be there to be put for happening. I believe it's kind of more towards the end of this year. Um, so we will see a chance, I think, be able to put a little bit more investment there. But I think what this has been has been a bit of a, a journey for us of of learning what works and i think now we've seen that it really does by conducting these pilots and i think it's something we would like to make if where we can if we have the uh, money to kind of commit to doing across our town centers on um, is there a bit of a, i've got gone i was just going to say but in um 5.6.7 of the report whilst footfall might be um a measure the transactional spend, the bounce back is coming back, so it's not the worst. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about looking at the whole set, isn't it, in order to interpret what the picture is for Eltham. And, um, and I would say we have invested as a council very significantly in Eltham in recent times through the public realm work that was undertaken as well as the cinema. So it's not that we're um, leaving Eltham to decline because there has been a significant investment uh, on the retail parks i think uh, again uh, you know if i had if i had huge budgets i'd just be doing stuff everywhere but um, again it's focusing the budgets that we have available the grant funding that we have available retail parks i think have been generally a little bit more robust um, than town centers and high street so i do think that if we're going to focus um, our limited uh, energy i think that the places that are struggling more are there so uh, obviously if, if if there was grant funding available for uh, for more work in those areas i would love to be doing more there but um, they have been holding up a little bit more um, um, than town centers and high streets Sorry, just on that, one thing was interesting in Charlton is are we collecting the data on the footfall in Charlton, equivalent to what we're doing in the town centres? No, it's not classed as the town centre for the purposes of the GLA measurements, um, so we don't actually currently uh, collect footfall for that area. The one thing, though, that we are doing um, um, that goes across all is the vacancy audits, um, which I think are really valuable. Um, we'll conduct, we conduct those on the retail parks um, and also across town centres and the neighbourhood shopping parades, so those kind of smaller areas. Um, and I think uh, there is, I think, a real value. That's a lot of work that goes into it. There are people out there, kind of, you know, our business team checking, and that's where we're able to see that we're actually doing quite well and we don't have that many vacancies. But sometimes I think also kind of taken to the point about Councillor Dingsell was talking about the, the empty shops. I think there's probably a value in publishing them um, because um, there are some that sit there that are empty for a really long time. And actually, I think it's really interesting for people to see it. A lot of people are not aware of land ownership, and a lot of people always assume it's the council and it's not actually always us but I think there's potential maybe for publishing those audits sharing that information allowing you know local community um, to kind of you know consider it um, and maybe you know choose to take action themselves choose to, to let those empty um, shops themselves so I, I kind of think that could potentially be quite empowering so that is one bit that we do on the retail parks but yeah sadly not footfall but there definitely is vacancy orders there <laughs> All right. Um, on apprenticeships, um, I noticed under 5.31, we have the figure for what last uh, 2021 low 4% with no qualifications, but it's not uh, giving us a direction of travel from where we've got to, and it's not benchmarked across other boroughs or the London comparator. So um, it's, it's just seemed that we're not able to scrutinize whether 4% is actually very good or not. Um, and also just on the underspend, um, how are we reaching out, working with our schools and academies to ensure that you know, they are making their pupils who are going through you know, from GCSE onwards that the apprenticeship might be the right route for them? And we certainly seems to be that we're wanting to encourage more younger people rather than our own employees later in their career to take up these apprenticeships. Okay, I'll start and then it might, it's gonna head probably down that way. Um, so um, we, I think one thing to, with the 4%, did you say it was 5.3.1 or? Uh, 5.3.1, yeah. 
Uh, here. Yeah, so I think one thing to highlight here is that we had um, the London Council's report, uh, which I think actually we could share, um, which I think will give you that really good kind of like borough kind of context, um, shows that there's a huge drop um, in that 16 um, to kind of like 20 I think it's more like 24, 25 um, age gap. So younger people are struggling to access um, apprenticeships at the moment. I think it was something about an 80% drop. It's, it's, it's pretty shocking. Um, what we're finding at the moment is younger people are um, having to kind of compete alongside older people um, for an apprenticeship. Um, you know, apprenticeships uh, are in... Greenwich, for example, I think are paid at like a London living wage weight uh, level as well. So, you know, they're good, you know, well paid. Um, and it, it, it's created an environment, I think, sadly, where young people are somewhat being pushed out uh, because that age, that ring fence is not kind of there anymore. Um, I think um, uh, I will let kind of like uh, kind of Fiona and um, maybe Kevin fit on a bit more about, but I think ultimately it's a London, we're definitely seeing it as a London wide issue or even further. Um, on the levy, I think it's the levy underspend, wasn't it? Um, the levy is near impossible to spend. I think that might be worth highlighting. It's hugely flawed. Um, uh, there's huge problems in the way that it's been structured. I sometimes fear it has been structured just so it is a tax that we have to give back to the government. Again, that's just my personal opinion. Um, uh, they, um, it is made very difficult to use, and you can only use it for training. You can't even use it for wages. So we, we every employer that pays it struggles to spend it. Um, and that isn't even taking into account then trying to get people to uh, take on an apprenticeship. So they're kind of almost two different um, difficulties, I guess, we're having. Uh, but spending the levy is, is, it needs reforming, in my opinion. It is not fit for purpose. Um, and um, I think it's really frustrating. We even passport out 25% of our levy to local businesses and we work really hard to kind of help businesses with what, which what is a really difficult and overly complicated system to navigate in order to get an apprentice. Um, I think Kevin actually was nearly signed someone up last night at the business awards though. So we work really hard to try and get people to take that. Um, but yeah, so the two different issues, but you know, two totally valid and I'll pass over to Fiona, Kevin, if they've got any more. Uh, one other structural problem that there are with apprenticeships at the moment is there are a lack of what we would call entry level, level two standards. They're actually, the government are reducing the amount that are available. So therefore, it's, it's almost a pinch point at that point. So employers then, there are more available at the higher end. So it, obviously that drives the market. Um, so, so, so we're not seeing those school leavers. There's not, there, there's not even the apprenticeship framework around it for them to be able to move into even if they were to choose to do so, which is affected London-wide, as we can see, nationally, really. Um, one of the other issues, I think, with apprenticeships, particularly for younger people, since the um, apprenticeship reforms, it's much more competitive to, to go into an apprenticeship, but it's also compounded by, by the fact that the landscape for 16-plus options is really complex, and there's been a lot of work recently to try and simplify it so young people actually know what the options are. Teachers, parents, guardians, for example, know where they should be steering young people to, to kind of look at um, different options. Um, additionally, you also find that gaining entry criteria for apprenticeships is now as academic as it would be to go into a university. And historically, it's been for people that prefer a much more practical route, hands-on route into, into employment. So that's kind of muddied the waters a little bit and made it much more complex to try and make it a route, particularly for young people. So as the figures um, show, Councillor um, Oliver mentioned, you, we've seen an increase in older people taking on apprenticeships while the number of younger people continues to decline um, over the past five years or so. Um, in terms of the question around engaging with schools, we are actively engaging with schools. There are a number of groups that we, we um, both engage with to try and push that message, to try and um, promote the, the offer, the support offer, actually to prepare people to be able to apply and compete for an apprenticeship, and also to make some of the, um, the opportunities that might be available either with the council or with other organisations that are trying to target um, young people. But um, that's part of a wider piece of work, trying to also educate parents um, on, on the apprenticeship option. And 
that stigma around the fact that you do an apprenticeship if you cannot get to university also still exists, so it further complicates matters. But um, we are trying to uh, push that message around the benefits of an apprenticeship as well as promoting it within our own services. Uh, and one, one more thing, wages tend to be higher for non-apprenticeship roles, which is obviously in a cost of living crisis, is a, is, is a factor for many families and school leavers and, and, and everybody. So uh, people are turning their back, probably misguidedly, but, but they're turning their back in, in order to take on the higher paid roles, which is unfortunate. Okay, I think we probably are getting ready to wrap up here. Councillor Oliver, I don't know if you want to come back in and wrap this up to kind of end this. It's okay if you feel like we've covered it all. Just wanted to say thank you very much for your time um, and thank you very much to the officers, um, all of them. There's been lots tonight, both teams. They're all doing really, really amazing work and I think that, you know, we have I'm very thankful for everything that they're doing, so thank you. Yeah, I think we would uh, mirror that thanks back, especially to all the officers. I know we've kept you here a while. Um, but we will release you now if that's okay. I think so. We'll just move on. We'll finish our meeting. We've got item seven, the forward plan. So we'd like to note the upcoming executive decisions set out in the forward plan and determine any items for scrutiny. Okay, I'm not, don't think I'm seeing anything here. In which case, we will finish the meeting. Thank you very much to everyone. Thanks to the officers who've been here this evening and all members who've contributed. Thank you so much.